a very, 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 very special guest. And you guys know who it is because I told you it's somebody that we talk about every week. So our very special guest is none other than Mr. Edwin. A smattering Ooh. of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Canned applause at that. <laughs> So thank you so much, Eric, for being here with us today. And we're so excited to have you here because we actually started off playing Madhouse, but then we ran out of Madhouse, then we transitioned to Times Squared, and then we ran out of Times Squared, and then we transitioned into Things Left Unsaid. And I realized that Things Left Unsaid is an album that we just don't talk enough about. It's a really awesome album, and I thank thought you. that it would be great. We could just ask Eric if he'd be willing, you know, to come on and talk to us about it. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for asking me. My, you know, my point in my life, I'm happy to be anywhere. So I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I don't have to, I don't have to leave my room either. So, <laughs> you know. Well, it's, it's an honor to have you here, sir. Well, the honor, the honor is mine. Believe me. So. Yes, yes. So we're going to get into it. And um, normally I would actually talk about the song that we just played and some of the players. But actually, since we have you here, do you mind talking specifically about Time's Gift? No, I'd love to talk about that song. Um, the song meant a lot to me. Um, the song was written by um, a friend of mine, a pianist from my days in Pittsburgh. Um, I, grew, I grew up in Pittsburgh. That's where my, my career began. My, my family moved to Pittsburgh when I was about 14 years old. So I went to high school in Pittsburgh. I went to music school in Pittsburgh. The first almost oh, 10, 12 years of my career was basically in Pittsburgh. Um, the writer of that song, Time's Gift, was a, a pianist and composer named uh, Don DePaulis. And he was few years older than me, um, he was somewhat of a mentor of mine. I, I learned an awful lot about jazz harmony uh, from him. Uh, some of my first jazz gigs were, were with him and, and others of his clique. Um, he wrote that song probably in the late 1970s, and I actually did a demo recording of it, I think around 1979, with, with the band that I had then in Pittsburgh. Um, just, just as a demo, never really went anywhere. So, and I always, always just absolutely loved that song. So I always thought that whenever I would, if I ever had the opportunity to really do, you know, to do an album that, that, that song might work on, that I would, I would do that. So, um, that's why that song was on the album. Um, I also have to add that from a, a harmonic perception it was one of, and still is, one of the most difficult songs I've ever had to play on. Mm. The harmonic sequence, uh, particularly behind the saxophone solo, is um, it's insidious. It <laughs> sounds very simple. It is not. It, it is a, you know, the, the, the sequence of the changes and the way they, they feed off of each other is really, really, at least for me anyway, really, really difficult. So I spent a lot of, a lot, a lot of time you know, learning how to play that song before I was even going to dare to take it in the studio. Um, anyway, it, it, it was just a song. I just absolutely adore that song. And and my Don, un, unfortunately, tragically passed away um, several years ago. Um, but years ago, he had sent me a whole stack of, of compositions of his. And there are things of his that I would love to be able to record sometime in the future also. But he, he was a tremendous, tremendous musician and meant an awful lot to me. Wow. Awesome, awesome. So there's a like there's kind of like a clicking noise. Do you guys hear that? Or is it just me? I do. I don't know where it's coming from. Um, but it stopped just then. Yeah, I don't hear it. Yeah, okay. Just, okay. All right. So um before we get started, I just want to um, let everybody in the chat know that today primarily we're gonna be talking about things left unsaid as well as Times Square. And the reason why we're talking about things left unsaid in Times Square, it's because Eric has spoken a lot already about Madhouse. He's already spoken a lot about the family. And to be honest, I actually don't have all of his 
interviews in the slideshow. And then remember what the slideshow is on our homepage. You, you can go to the front homepage and all these links will actually go directly to those um, interviews with Eric. So you can listen to Michael Dean's four part 2017 interview. You can listen to Princess Friend 2019 two part interview. You can listen to the Science Time Super Deluxe Celebration where it was Eric Leeds, um, Atlanta Blitz, and Dr. Fink. It was, that was a really amazing conversation. Um, and then you can also go to Funktopias that have, uh, from 2021, that have a couple of episodes. Then there's also St. Paul's Music on the Run um, podcast, which is a really special one because St. Paul and Eric Leeds are in the same room. And um, for those of you who just got to get your madhouse on, you can go to the Sign Time Super Deluxe Celebration and Dr. Fink talk to us about Madhouse Live specifically. So I just want you to know that the time is going to go by super fast. And I really want to concentrate on Eric's solo records because uh, we don't talk enough about them. So I hope that you'll understand that I'm going to ignore your madhouse questions. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do a little bit of an icebreaker. And today, actually, the sex of it was recorded on July 29th. Today is July 29th of 1987. And I know that Kid Creole and the Coconuts is one of Eric's favorite groups. And I know that yep. you also recorded on the song. So can you tell us about the sex of it? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I, I was and am a huge, huge fan of, of Kid Creole. Um, absolutely just loved him. And... Um, he had, uh, they had released an album, I think it was 1987 when we did this, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 87. Yeah, his his album, Kid Creole's album, uh, I Too Have Seen the Woods, the Forest, had just come out. Anyway, there was a song on that album called Dancing the Bandu. It was one of my absolute favorite songs that, that Kid Creole did. And I, I, I had just gotten the album, had just come out, and I was just listening to that song, particularly nonstop. And um, I happened to be out at Paisley one afternoon and um, went in, in into one of the studios just to see what was going on. Um, and Prince, Prince wasn't there, but there was a track up that he, he had been working on. And uh, I asked Susan Rogers, who was still working with Prince then, uh, I said, what, what's he got up? And she played me this track, which was the, the sex of it. And I, I heard it and I laughed and I said, oh, Prince got the new Kid Creole album. <laughs> I, mean, I, said, I said, oh boy, this, 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 this sounds too much like a Kid Creole kind of thing. Hmm. Um, so I put, put a horn arrangement on it. And like a lot of other things that we did with Prince at that time, you, you know, you might do a song and you never hear from it again. It goes in the vault and that's the last of that. I actually have no idea whether he... Um, wrote the song specifically for Kid Creole because mm -hmm. it didn't end up going to Kid Creole until several years later. Um, it, it actually, I think, ended up on what I think was Kid Creole's first album for, was it Columbia Records? I think he signed with it. That yeah, time. it was Columbia and the record yeah. came out in 1990. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how long the thing had been sitting around. Now, Prince may have sent it to him much earlier, and, and Kurt Creel might have been just waiting for it to put it on, on whatever album he could put it on. Um, but anyway, that that's, you know, but there, there was, to me, there was no coincidence that, that Prince did that track when he did it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that insight. Really do appreciate it. All right. So um, before we start talking about specific songs about things left unsaid, I really want to talk to you about the art direction for the album. It's actually one of my favorite covers. Mm -hmm. And like the inserts, it's just like it creates like this mood. Um, and so can you tell us, like, did you did you have this idea of how you kind of wanted this jazz club setting or was it the art director? Can you tell us a little bit about how the cover came about? That really was the, the art director at Warner Brothers who, who was responsible for, for that idea. Um, and I, I just basically went along with it. I mean, my, <laughs> my, I, I, I hate photo shoots <laughs> and things like I, I loathe them. I hate having to be in photo shoots. I hate having to be in videos. I mean, I just, <laughs> that's just, you know, just, 
I, mainly because I don't like the hours. You have to get up very early. That, that doesn't work with me. Um, but it's, it's really just standing around waiting a lot, you know, for whatever's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, so basically I, I really just, um, I have very little, very few ideas about what photo shoots or what the, you know, the artwork should be. So I'm basically, you know, I've done my part. I've made the music. You, you guys got to sell it. Mm -hmm. So tell me what you need me to, you know, tell me what you want this to look like. If it's something that I don't want or don't think is good, I'm going to let you know, but mm -hmm. come to me with the idea. So, mm -hmm. so this seemed cool. And at that point it's like, okay, this is fine. Let's do this and get it done. You can put your pick, my, put my picture on the album, get it out there. Um, the, in in looking back at that particular photo shoot, um, what I probably remember most about it is there was probably more money spent on that photo shoot than I usually have to spend on the entire album. Wow. On subsequent, you know, I mean, I, I was fortunate to have um, pretty generous recording budgets for my Paisley Park albums. Mm -hmm. Um and realizing making an album like things left on set, I was probably, it was probably going to be unlikely that I would have a recording budget like that in, in the future. I can't <laughs> believe me that it, 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 it has never been like that again. So I just laugh and I said, I wonder really how much was spent on just, you, you know, the couple of days for that photo shoot just compared, you know, I would love, I think a lot of artists would love to have that money just to make an album with. So, yeah, for anyway, sure. Yeah. Can, can I ask you something about just leading into the album? Like what, um, what was sort of the consensus or the idea? Was it supposed to be a madhouse thing and then decided that, you know what, shift it, over to this? And then the other this, is, quick question. this is how it really, it really okay. came about. Um, things left unsaid, there is an invisible hand in, in that album. That invisible mm -hmm. hand is Prince. Mm -hmm. um, Prince had absolutely nothing to do with any of the music on that album. In fact, when I started recording, between the time that I started recording the music for Things Left Unsaid, I don't think Prince heard one bit of it until the album was completely done. And basically, mm. he was handed the finished product. Mm. So, but Times Squared, uh, the previous album, was supposed to be the third Madhouse album. Mm. And only when... Um, you see, the first two, you know, just briefly, just to put a context, Madhouse is not me. Madhouse is Prince. I just had a role in Madhouse. And and, and the, the role obviously was bigger than it would be to me just being a sideman or playing on any of his own vocal music. Right. Because essentially my, my horns were the equivalent of the lead vocal for Madhouse. Um, but they were his projects. And all of the final decisions that were made were made by him. Um, when it came time to doing what we were going to do, this third Madhouse album, Prince was involved with other things at the time, and he didn't have um, the time to spend on it. So for the first time, he actually threw it at me and said, OK, this is where I think you should be going with this, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Times Squared was what came of that. After Prince heard the final mixes and everything for everything that I had done for Times Squared, Obviously, he liked it very much, but he said to me, it doesn't sound like a Madhouse record anymore. And I said, well, that's probably true, basically, because this was really more my input. Mm -hmm. And although most of the music on Times Squared was stuff that had originated with Prince, I was taking it and basically giving carte blanche to do whatever I wanted to do with it. So that's when Prince decided, OK, I would like to sign you as a solo artist of Paisley Park Records, and this is going to be your first album. Well, you know, dream come true, you mm -hmm. know, basically, although to be absolutely honest, if I had known beforehand or if he had come to me originally and said, let's put Madhouse on the side and I'm going to sign you, Times Square probably wouldn't have been an album that I would have made. Mm -hmm. Things Left Unsaid would have been. Mm -hmm. Now, when it came time to um, do a second album, the way artist contracts usually work is you might get an album contract that might say um, seven or eight albums, but it's all options. So basically they're looking at the performance of the preceding album and the record company might say, well, you didn't sell as many records as we thought you would, so we're not gonna pick up the option. You're free, bye, get out of here. 
Um, I had no illusions or, or necessarily expectations on whether or not Prince was going to pick up the option for me to do a second album. Now, uh, very conveniently, by that time, my brother Alan was actually the head of Paisley Park Records, <laughs> which is a nice thing to have if you're an artist. So it's not a bad thing to have your brother running the record company. But that um, that possible conflict of interest put aside, <laughs> Prince was still the person that's going to actually make the decision. Mm. So I went into him and uh, to have a sit down. And basically, I need to find out from because the timeline was such that if they were going to pick up the option, they now had like a 60 day window in which to make that decision. So I'm sitting down with Prince and I said, look, I just need to know one thing. Are you picking up the option so I can do another album? We had a very in interesting and kind of funny conversation. Um, but the point was, is that finally, after about a half hour, 45 minutes of just talking about this, that and the other, I just said, look, dude, I need an answer because if you're not picking up the option, I need to get the hell out of here real quick and try to find somebody that might want to record, mm -hmm. you know, do a record for me. Mm -hmm. So he looked at me and he laughed. He said, oh, man, we're, I'm picking up the show. You can do another album. I said, OK, fine. At this point, it was like um, him asking me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I've got I've got a working band and I've got a stack of material on my own that I could start with. But Warner Brothers had just revamped their entire jazz department and brought mm -hmm. in some new people. They had brought in a new A&R man, a guy named Matt Pearson. They were expanding the scope of the department. And my brother, basically, while I'm signed to Paisley Park Records, we are completely dependent on all of the marketing and distribution of Warner Brothers, which gives us the opportunity to then take advantage of all the resources that they have as a major label including the A&R department in, in the new A&R jazz department. So I told Prince, Alan and I really think it's, it's essential for us, first of all, to sit down with, with Matt Pearson at Warner Brothers and have a conversation with him and see what we can come up with and see what they can provide for me based on where basically I would kind of like to go. And Prince mm -hmm. laughed and he looked at me and says, you want to get in bed with the suits? <laughs> you know. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because Prince always had, you know, Prince is well known as not, not exactly having the most cordial relationship with anybody that he perceives as not a musician, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I basically told Prince, I said, look, Prince, these are the people that can provide me with the opportunities and the musicians that I want to work with. Mm. And I said, do you have my back? Because if you have my back, then if they run cockeyed, I can always say, well, you know something? Prince may not like that idea. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my ace in the hole. Okay. And Prince looked at me and he said, Eric, I got your back. Wow. That's amazing. And basically what was, he said, get the, now get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. Go where, do whatever you need to do to make your music. And you are not restricted and say, get out of here because what you need to do isn't around here. Go. And that's basically what it was. So then we went to Warner Brothers, sat down, and we just rolled from there. Um, and any other aspect of my relationship with Prince when it comes to being in his band or his music or whatever, for me, the most significant thing about my relationship with him was basically him telling me, I got your back. Mm -hmm. And him providing me the opportunity to do what I had always really ever wanted to do was that make my own music in the way that I wanted to make it. And basic and and you know the, the there's no, there's only one I, I can't say this without it set, sounding self serving, which hasn't has never stopped me before. So mm -hmm. <laughs> so Talk to um <laughs> it's kind of been unusual for Prince to take an interest in somebody or that he was, you know, and basically um, no strings attached mm -hmm. because basically what he was telling me and, and he basically said it to me, he said, all I'm interested in hearing what you got, go mm -hmm. out and, you know, whatever you do, that's all I want to hear. So get out of here. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you carte blanche, no strings attached, whatever you want to do, with whomever, 
go do that. And and that it's a lot of trust that you had. In yeah. Me. And and, you, you know, um, like anybody else that knew Prince and knew him well, I could, I could I could tell you stories about Prince that, you know, aren't the most complimentary things in the world, because on any given day, this was still who he was. But all mm -hmm. of that is Tweedledum Tweedledee. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is what the dude did for me. Mm -hmm. And I, you, you know, I can never be grateful enough for that. So, you know. Could I ask a, could I ask a brief question? Sure. Did you ever feel that that you were treated when you when you interface with Warner Brothers Jazz? Mm -hmm. Did you feel that you were treated as a Warner Brothers Jazz artist, or was it Prince's sax player who's now making a foray into albums? And I ask it that way because with Warner Brothers coming out of the late '80s, going into the early '90s, they had David Sanborn, they had Joe Sample. They had Michael Franks. They had Miles yeah. Davis for a period. And yeah. even, uh, I believe, early, what, 93, maybe 94, Joshua Redman, another tenor well, sax player, was coming out. Did you unsaid, feel that you were piped in to that? I was not signed to Warner Brothers. So they were not interested or did yeah. they, have a, they did not have accountability okay. to my album like they would. Joshua Redman had just been signed by Matt Pearson. Right. Joshua, uh, Red okay. Joshua Redman's first album was released almost at the same time that Things Left Unsaid was. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I actually was doing some promo tours with Joshua, uh, <laughs> doing radio station interviews together with him. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and it, was, it was very humbling, believe me, because the hype on, on Joshua was that mm -hmm. here's this kid who was the son of the great Dewey Redman. Mm -hmm. um, saxophone, jazz saxophone, legendary jazz saxophone player. Um, he had been, where was he? Was he at Harvard or was he at Yale? I think he was at Harvard, but he was a pre-med student hmm. who had decided to put all that aside and just pursue his muse in, in music. So, he had so a this backstory. is the stuff, right. <laughs> so, th so this backstory is like <laughs> uh -huh. a, a, a jazz publicist dream. So I'm doing this, so I'm doing these radio interviews mm. and oh we got Joshua and they're going through this and then they say, and now here's Eric Lees and he plays saxophone with Prince. And right, uh, and right, like, right, oh, right, okay, right, 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 right. Um now once again, having Prince as my ace in the hole was what enabled me to take advantage of the resources mm -hmm. that the, that the jazz department could bring to me, they probably would have loved nothing more than for me to do, quote, a madhouse like hmm. funk, r and b like jazz record, which was not what my interest was in mm -hmm. any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, though, um, they, they came and, you know, the thing was a producer... The first thing that we decided on was was who should produce, and and I was dead set on having an outside producer, mm -hmm. and we settled on Gil Goldstein, who was a, a, a very very well known keyboard player and composer arranger from New York, who had had um, you know a, a, a career very solid career. I, I was well aware of Gil Goldstein, and thought that that was an absolute wonderful choice. Um, and it was. I mean, what Gil brought to the music and and mm -hmm. and, and to the album was um, was essential. You know, I could pr probably go through every song of the album and point exactly what Gil brought to it that that you know added value, because the whole point was to put me in a context that I couldn't be in on myself. Okay. And I've I've made a lot of music just on my own, and I know what I am capable of, but. After a while, you get bored with that because I said, well, I, I, I know me. I want to know what I can do when put in a situation where I have to react from all of this other input. And Gil Goldstein and this Warner Brothers department, they're going to be able to give me the resources because when they first asked me, so, well, Eric, we know what weather report, what that band meant to you. Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. said, we can get you Alejandro Acuna and Alfonso Johnson maybe to play on your record. And you're and like, I'm, hell I'm, yes. Yeah, I, I said, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that, that's, yeah, that, I'll pick up, you need to call them right now, mm -hmm. you know, before we go, you know, so those are the things. Now, on the other hand, you know, I'm looking and oh my God, you know, I, I got to step up my game. But you see, that's the whole point. Um, the musician that I was going into that album and the musician that I was coming out of it, 
was you know I, I wanted an album where my what, what's the phrase my my reach is greater than my grasp or is it the other way around like I mean I'm, I'm, kind of right, I'm, I'm <laughs> they're bringing all of this in and it's like this is my album but I'm the one that's got to like step up and given the opportunity to do that was um, that was what, what was so essential um, I knew I could make a record mm, mm. but you know, this was like, okay, th this is where I have always wanted to be. I got to see, do I belong here? Mm, you know, can, mm -hmm. can I make this work? So that was what was so essential about that. So for all of the sometimes cockeyed ideas that they, that Warner Brothers and Matt Pierce and Gil Colson, I mean, they came with some, you know, a bunch of ideas that I would, might have just rejected out of hand. But mm -hmm. it's like, if they bring me, you know, for every 20 ideas or uh, options that they bring, if there are two or three that I'm saying, OK, this is where this is where I want to go and I can utilize them, then all the rest of the stuff, like I see, is, is Tweedledum, Tweedledee. Um, having that opportunity in those surroundings and 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 what, what was essential. I couldn't have done that. I, I once again, I couldn't have done that at Paisley Park. Mm, mm -hmm. Now, you know, I'll, I'll give you a little back. Another thing about about Prince's relationship with me and and his interest about that. Once again, I I, I can't say this without it being self serving. Prince realized really where I wanted to go, even maybe before I did. Mm. When we were doing Times Squared, there are two songs on that album that pianist Ricky Peterson, Paul Peterson's older brother, plays. I had known, I knew of Ricky. I'd only met him a couple times. I had never worked with Ricky. Um, Ricky was David Sanborn's musical director for years. I mean, he's he's mm -hmm. a first call mm -hmm. keyboard player. He's been on the road with Stevie Nicks, you know, and her touring for the last several years. Um, Ricky is one of the the most remarkable musicians that I've ever had had the opportunity to work with. But I had never met, never had the opportunity to work with him yet. So while I'm doing Times Squared, there were two songs on that album. There was a song called Andorra, mm -hmm. which actually the original track was left over from the sessions that had yielded the second Madhouse album. Mm. And I was taking that track and doing a whole lot of different things with it. And it was actually cutting it up. I was taking pieces and reordering them. Wow. coming up with it with with a new scheme of trying to make because the track really wasn't finished so mm -hmm. i kind of had mm -hmm. to take what was there and try to construct something else out of it there had been a, a, a piano solo of princes on the original track but by the time i had started editing and reforming this tune that solo was dumped it went away so mm -hmm. and there was another song on the album called once upon a time Mm -hmm. that did not have any keyboard it was just guitars and i put my horns on some synthesizer pads and things like that but i wanted a piano track on it to just kind of bring everything together kind of like a glue track to kind of bring all the ex extemporaneous kind of make sense out of everything so you have to understand at this point this is still supposed to be a madhouse record mm -hmm. so i'm thinking well this is madhouse so i'm going to go to prince so i mm -hmm. went to prince i said look i recut this you know reordered and re edited this song that, that we had left over from, from the last Madhouse session. I need you to come in and put a new piano solo on it. Also, this other song, I need you to just put like an extemporaneous piano thing on it. So he was listening to a couple minutes of what I did and he looked at me and said, uh-uh. And I said, what do you mean? He said, no. He said, you need to call Ricky Peterson. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, Eric, I can put something on here that would that would be cool but where you're going with this you need somebody with the vocabulary and the harmonic experience of somebody like ricky and he said he's the guy in this town in minneapolis go to ricky peterson and he laughed and he looked at me he says you will thank me in the morning <laughs> you know wow that's and Prince telling I, you to go i call somewhere. i call ricky i said ricky um i have been told <laughs> that you need to come in and do this. <laughs> Ricky came in. Now understand, I knew Ricky, but I'd never really worked with him yet. And on the first song, within the first 30 seconds, I'm just saying, oh shit. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> this, this is, you know. 
his harmonic vocabulary, his baby, you know, to channel like a Herbie Hancock, a Chick Corea, a Keith Jarrett, a Joe Zavinul, a McCoy Tyner, all yeah. of that that he carries within him that makes up who he is, all of that he could bring to bear on this music. Prince couldn't do that. That's not what Prince was. And wow. Prince was the one who was telling me, uh uh, That's this is above my pay grade. And when wow. Prince says something to you like that, you listen. This was a certain this was a circumstance where Prince and me are talking to each other as musicians. Mm, mm -hmm. He isn't he isn't Prince the superstar. He is sitting. We are talking about music and he's hearing what this is and saying, Eric, this is where you need to go with this. Mm -hmm. I know you know that, but uh, uh and maybe I know you're coming to me because it's our thing. But uh, uh this ain't my thing no more. You're, you know, so that background kind of led to his basically giving me carte blanche to go with things left unsaid. That was kind of the precursor to that. Because if he's basically telling me, this is where you need to go, get out of here. Mm -hmm. Just go make your music with whom, you know. And like I said, when when a musician of Prince's caliber is willing to basically have that kind of a conversation and a relationship with, with you on that basis, that's worth it. That's worth its weight in gold, obviously. So... Could I ask one small follow-up question? Sure. Okay. So mm -hmm. the really cool thing about Things Left Unsaid, in real time, when Times Square was released, before mm -hmm. social media, before all that, I don't know how the hell I found out, probably because I went to the record store a lot, but I'm saying, <laughs> Eric Lees has a solo album. Holy shit, we got to go get it. And we got it. Okay. Things Left Unsaid comes out, and immediately you know, I, 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 I'm amazed and happily amazed that Prince was the hidden hand. But yeah. you clearly hear that, okay, the Prince is not involved in this music. There are these musical cues that just don't, that don't exist there. Right. This is yeah. more of an improvisational group. And when I talk about jazz, I really talk about it in the terms of improvisational music, mm -hmm. where particularly live, the same song isn't played in the same kind of way, and you're actually having these conversations between musicians on the stage. Things, yeah. le things left unsaid is feeling more towards that. Oh, was there a question? Yeah, there absolutely was. <laughs> Prince talking to you like that and saying those things about, you know what, this is who you need to call. Even though Prince in his upbringing, his father, those experiences, grew up in an, with a foundational for improvisational music, I never saw Prince, even in the Madhouse context, as an improvisational musician. It's yep. more of a contribution, more of a, here's my part, here's your part, and within this framework. Yeah. Do you? F it's a good. Was way that sort of like the underlying context of it? It's like that's not where I live. This is where you're going. This is who you need to surround I, yourselves with. I don't know if it was quite as much that is is just um, two, two two comments about about that. Um, Prince could be extraordinarily spontaneous. Okay. When he wanted to be, but. When he was spontaneous, it was not to serve a purpose. It was hmm. just because he was just spontaneous. Madhouse was kind of the embodiment of that. I was never a fan of Madhouse. I never cared for the first Madhouse album ever. Mm -hmm. I like most of the second <laughs> album. Mm -hmm. But Madhouse was... You know, the first Madhouse album, <laughs> I don't listen to that. There's, I, I, I kind of <laughs> like the last piece, the, the song called Eight. Eight. Mm -hmm. There is little else on that album that was ever of any interest to me at all. Now, that's just personal taste. Sure. Because on any given day, I'd like to think that Prince and I could go and make music that I might like. And uh, we have. Mm -hmm. I've got stuff, Mad I've got Madhouse stuff that we recorded years later that's never been released that I happen to think is much better than anything that was ever released. But mm -hmm. that's just personal taste mm -hmm. as to what a particular song might be. Now, what the point was, is that a lot, I've got my own private collection of jams, mm -hmm. you know, including the infamous flesh sessions and all of mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. That from a standpoint uh -huh. of me wanting to listen is just pure music. Uh -huh. I enjoy much more. And it was completely spontaneous. When Prince, my thing with Prince is he would take the ideas that might come up spontaneously, and then he would work them to death. <laughs> you know?
you know? But I think more with the kind of music that I was going to with Things Left Unsaid, if there is any one component of, of Prince's um, toolbox that wasn't as developed as the other aspects of, of his artistry, Prince did not have a grounding or a background in what we would refer to as Tin Pan Alley harmony. In other words, the harmony of the great American songbook mm -hmm. dating back to, you know, when you're talking about Duke Ellington, the Louis Armstrong, Paul Porter, Louis Armstrong, mm -hmm. Billy Strayhorn, Jerome Kern, all of that stuff. That was so much a fundamental aspect of what modern jazz was. Mm -hmm. And he could he could do things superficially. But it real. But once you scratch beneath the surface, he didn't mm -hmm. have that vocabulary. Now. What's really important from, from, from the standpoint of his career is that that's really irrelevant because, you know, the, the structures and the harmonies of When Doves Cry or Little Red Corvette or Ballad of Dorothy Parker or, mm -hmm. or Strange Relation or any other thing that he would do wasn't dependent on that. So to, so to say that he didn't have that vocabulary is almost irrelevant because it wasn't something that was important for what he did. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. almost like suggesting that a classical, a symphonic classical musician that cannot improvise, that's irrelevant for that person's career. You know, you don't go, you, you, you know, you don't go to hear a classical pianist play, play a, a Beethoven piano concerto expecting him to be able to, you know, to play jazz. Mm -hmm. It's irrelevant. So by the same token, but I think Prince understood that the music that I was going, that I basically was based on and everything and things left unsaid, even though there might be more advanced harmonies and structures that are more indicative of what was happening in the music in the 60s and 70s and after that, but it's still so much predicated on the jazz harmonic vocabulary mm -hmm. that I grew up learning because this is what you have to know if you want to try to play this music. Prince, like I said, Prince's spontaneity could be incredible, but it was still always going to be limited by his harmonic vocabulary. So mm -hmm. if we were jamming with Prince, mm -hmm. it was pretty much, well, I'm playing 20 minutes on one chord. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that isn't going to, you know, in order for me to play a song like I mentioned, like a time's gift or any of the of the material on things left unsaid. That's a whole different thing. So just real quick, were you on the uh, and I should know this. I'm tripping out. The was it the expectation? His other sort of jazz. Mm -mm, I was no. Candy Dofer. No, that, okay. that was that was Candy. I think. Have yeah. you heard that record? Um, I know I never heard it. I actually played a little bit of that music once in a rehearsal with him. But that that's that's you know. But I don't know that if if I did hear it was on, in order to just kind of get an idea of what it was. I got you. Know, you. The the last, I think the last thing that I ever recorded with prince was that that thing that that we did that he called news n-e-w-s okay yeah yeah yeah, we, yeah. We, now, so with that how do you feel his harmonics or his skill or playing had it evolved that's a good point because we're 20 years past right yeah. um no one thing about <laughs> prince is that <laughs> no, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, a, it's an it's an interesting thing and and um I don't think news is anything that we couldn't have done 10 years before, mm. yeah, okay. but it's dependent on the musicians because in, in, in the news thing on keyboards, we had Hernato Neto, mm -hmm. who was mm -hmm. the keyboard player at the time. I had known Hernato because I played with Hernato in a band with Sheila E. We called the E train in 94, 95, which was probably one of the most ridiculously incredible bands I ever played with. Mm. It was just mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal. And from a, from a standpoint of his harmonic and complete knowledge of music, Renato Neto was hands down probably the most complete keyboard player Prince ever had. And I don't mean that as I don't mean that as an as a criticism of anybody else, the Matt Finks, the Tommy Elms, uh, particularly Lisa Coleman, who mm -hmm. had such a rich harmonic palette of her own. Mm -hmm. But Renato mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. a beast. 
mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. only with mm-hmm. a full mm-hmm. complement of of the jazz vocabulary, harmonic vocabulary, but because he came from from Brazil, he's got that whole thing mm. that is rhythmically so unique, and what he adds to that. So having him on the news thing opened things up. So a lot of the things, so Prince is basically saying, you guys open it up and I'll follow you as best I can. And Oof. Prince Hung, I mean, you know, yeah, that, 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 that was cool. You're sending you know? me right now, Prince Hung. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm here for all of that. Yeah. You know, here, here's, here's, here's the interesting thing. If Prince was such an intrinsically um, gifted musician mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that I am convinced that if there was anything that he really was interested in wanting to learn or grasp, he could probably do it much more quickly than a lot of other people could. But his interests mm-hmm. were what they were, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm I'm not saying you know he doesn't owe me any apologies or explanations for anything that I might say. Gee, I wonder what Prince could have done if only he had been interested in doing that. That's not for me to say. But right. the fact is, is that I knew what a, what a tremendous musician he was under everything else. And I would always have loved to say, you know, what if this dude had actually decided, I'm going to learn how to read and write music in order to broaden my mm-hmm. understanding of, of that harmonic vocabulary that maybe I don't necessarily have. Would have been fascinating to see what he might have done, you know, with that. But yet and still... His catalog of music kind of speaks for itself. So it's mm-hmm. like, yeah. you know, dude, you were just fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to dive into um, some more songs on things left unset. And I want to play the intro, but I'm not going to play the song because you guys know what happened when I played the song last time. I just totally like get lost in the music. Um, so for those of you who, don't, who may not have heard this in a while or you weren't on that episode, let's play the opening lines, which is one of my favorite, like just the layered horns that you do, Eric, here is just mind blowing. So let's give it a listen. <laughs> Eric, talk to us about Aguadilla. Well, uh, for, first of all, it's uh, Aguadilla. Uh, the, uh, thank the, the you. L- uh, yeah. Yes. Um, Aguadilla is a uh, town or village in in Puerto Rico. Um, as, as, as far as as far as that intro, um, that that's just <laughs> Charlie Parker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's just, that's just Charlie Parker. That's John Coltrane. That's Miles Davis. That's just like that's Duke Ellington. That's Count Basie. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's basically the the um, what you're doing. I think there were five saxophones. I think I actually played alto on that. I very rarely play alto saxophone, mm-hmm. but I did mm-hmm. on that. Um, I think I just used two altos, two tenors, and a baritone, which is a classic combination of saxophone section from a, a traditional big band, whether Duke Ellington, Count Basie, whatever. Um, the harmonic um, point is is what's called closed voicing. If you really were to be able to isolate every instrument, the alto and the baritone are playing the same notes, Mm -hmm. but they're an octave apart because the baritone is pitched an octave below the alto. The other alto and the two tenors are providing the the harmony notes in between. It's a style of writing that dates back to the 1920s. I mean, you know, it's just that I'm putting it in a context. The actual melody, if you can call it a melody, is what I wrote is an intro. So if there's anything, but, but the style of writing, God, I was doing that when I was in, in, in music school. So it worked, you know, and, and it's, it's just a fun style of writing. I said, you know, I got an opportunity to do something like that in order to show off, say, Hey, I can do this too. (laughs) So um, that's all that was. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to the, um, the credits here, because on the CD in the in the liner notes, it says composed by Eric Lees and Prince. And the reason why, according to Prince Vault, that Prince gets that co-writing um, credit is that um, you sort of cribbed a line uh, from Desire, 
Yeah. And is that the reason? Just yeah. to make sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's a little, a little counter line that go ba da 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 da. That line kind of goes through one. the whole background yeah. of of Agua D and that and that I. You know. Yeah. yeah. So. Another one of my really favorite songs is um, Isla Mujeres, if I'm saying mm -hmm. that correctly. I'm going to play a little bit for us. Just gonna get, it's, it's, listen to a little bit. We played this one last week. I think this is one of the most beautiful songs ever written. It was composed by, is it Santi Vega? Santi Vega, yeah. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful song. Can, so, Eric, please talk to us about this one. Um, Gil, Gil Goldstein brought this song to me. Um, knowing that, that I had um, an absolute love of Latin music, Brazilian music, particularly Cuban and Puerto Rican music. Um, my favorite musician, my favorite living musician for probably the last 30, 40 years has been Eddie Palmieri, mm. um, who was like the son of, you know, just just in, in the context of Afro-Cuban salsa music, Eddie Palmieri is the Thelonious Monk, Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, all in one. Um, one of my absolute tre most treasured relationships in, in music is, is with Eddie Palmieri. The fact that I've had the opportunity to play without Eddie Palmieri on several occasions is is as is much the high point of my life as anything I could imagine. Um, anyway, um, Gil brought this song, I Ilo Mujeres, um, by Spanish composer Santi Vega. And um, we didn't really do too much. The, the version that, that Santi Vega had done, we, we pretty much stuck to that basic vibe. Um, but I added the the piano montuno, the bang, the bang, dong, 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 you know, that's mm -hmm. just an Afro-Cuban montuno. That we put in to basically give it a little bit more of a, a, a Caribbean vibe than just a straight up um, Brazilian or Spanish. Um, and the horn players, the three horn players on this album, Brian Lynch on trumpet, Charlie Sepulveda on trumpet, Conrad Irwig on trombone. Um, they are on the album because they were the poor horn section for Eddie Palmieri at that <laughs> point. So it was like, I'm like, you know, I'm like looking at Gil Goldstein. He's hooked up, he lives in New York, and we're going to do a lot of this record, a lot of the recording for this album in New York. And I'm saying, do you know any of those, you know those guys? And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, um, you need to see if you can get them on my record. So like, <laughs> I said, okay, Gil, do your thing, be, be the producer. So that was that hookup. Um, and in fact, um, Charlie Sefulveda was the trumpet player with me in the band years later, this band that we had with Sheila E, the E train, Brian Lynch also played in that band. So that was the beginning of my relationship with them. Um, what they brought, unfortunately, there was no real room in the album for any of them to really solo. There's some trumpet mm -hmm. obligados on Ilo My Hairs that you hear little trumpet answers to the saxophone line. That was Charlie, Charlie Sepulveda. Um, but the sound and the character of their phrasing that they brought to the horn parts on this album was just absolutely disrupted gorgeous. It was one of the most um, enjoyable aspects of the recording the album to, to, to have them come in and play the arrangements that I had written for this album. How, how did that feel? It sounded like you were geeking out, like when you're in the studio and you're listening back to this. Like, that feels you like know, what one... One of the most wonderful experiences that you can have as an artist, particularly when you're working on your own music, is I knew what these guys were going to bring to it, but just knowing it and then hearing it mm -hmm. is a different thing. Mm -hmm. And you can get a lot of wonderful, wonderful musicians that are still guns for hire. And they might come in and they might do exactly what you want them to do. But you realize that for them, this session is just one of two or three sessions they're doing this week. Mm. And as soon as they're out the door, they've forgotten about this one. Mm. You know, So you take advantage of what they're going to bring. You said, okay, he did exactly what I needed them to do. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I said, thank you very much. Here's your check. Have a nice day. Um, with Charlie Bryan and Conrad, because they were already a section that had been working together for years, I knew that they had 
a sound and a cohesiveness that was going to really bring something special. All of the saxophone parts and the ensembles that they were going to be recording to had already been done. So they were coming in and listening to the tracks as, as they were pretty much completed by that time. Um, I, I remember specifically the most um, ambitious parts were on, on a song called Two Sisters, which was written by Alfonso Johnson. Um, the last few minutes of, of that song has an outvamp that, that is, is a, just a cascade of, of, of these horn lines. And I had already done the saxophone parts. So they're coming in and they have to match their phrasing to what was already there, you know. Um, and I, I mean, you, you know, I had no, no worries about them nailing it. But there was a middle where they were doing one aspect of it. And Charlie Sepulveda, who is the lead trumpet player, he's the top voice. So basically, that's what really is going to give character to the whole section. Because you hear that top voice more prominently just by the fact it's the highest notes in, 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 the, in the section. And I remember Charlie stopping the other guys and said, he said, Brian Conrad, we got to tighten this up a little bit. Listen to where Eric is. He's laying just a little bit behind the beat. So we got to hold back. We can't push that. Let's really just be sure we're in the pocket with him because that's what we're here to do. And when you're sitting in the control room and listening mm -hmm. to cats come in off the, you know, come in and, and say that, all I can do is just be, have a big smile on my face. I said, this is what, this, this, this is what you want. You know, th this, when cats come in and they're listening to it and they said, you know, we can come in, just do what we do, but no, let's, let's, this is, you know, we're here to make Eric's music, mm. what it has, what, what we can do. So let's, let's listen to that. And just those little nuances like that, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just sitting there, man, this is killing. All of a sudden Charlie <laughs> stopped and said, no, we need to nail, mm. just lay it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. We can do this. Mm -hmm. And Charlie's, you know, and then they come in the, and when they come in and they're coming in the booth to listen to the playback and I can look at their eyes and see what they're reacting to. And then you know that these are the guys you want on mm -hmm. your record. Yeah. And this recorded at Paisley Park? No, th those oh. sessions were done in New York. Okay. Yeah. I will. Mo <laughs> most, most of the basic tracks um, most of them, except for a couple, were done at Paisley only because we were flying in Alejandro Acuna and Alfonso Johnson from California. Gil Goldstein and my piano player, David Budway, were coming in from New York and Pittsburgh. So geographically, doing it at Paisley made the best sense. Once we had done the basic tracks at Paisley, and I had done a bunch of overdubs at Paisley, then I went to New York, and everything else was done in New York, and all the mixing for the album was done in New York. Yeah. Mm. I was going to ask, when you have these musicians that you respect and they're coming in, is there also a thing where they know, like, Eric uh, is a part of Prince's camp? There's a, is there a certain type of respect or prestige where they like, we got to come in and get down? Like, we can't, this ain't just some, like you said, a work for hire. Like, are, is that sort of an unspoken respect that, okay, we know you a part of, and we know we heard about this guy. He's great. You, you great. You know this ain't a regular project for us. Is that sort of vibe going on too? No. You said no. No. <laughs> I doubt if any of the musicians on this album ever regularly listened to anything Prince had ever done. Mm -hmm. They might have. They were told this is guy. They might have listened to Prince's music in order to say, well, I need to learn, learn who this guy is. I have no mm -hmm. illusions that Alejandro Acuna, Alvo Johnson had ever heard of me before. Would mm -hmm. have no reason to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or Charlie Sepulveda, or Brian Lynch, or Conrad Irwin. Now, Prince has a reputation as, as an incredible artist. So even with musicians like that, who may not be familiar with Prince's music, because it may just not be the music that they normally listen to. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't been involved with Prince, Prince isn't the music that I would have normally have listened to. Mm -hmm. To be absolutely honest. Um, but they understand that, okay, if this guy played with Prince, well, that says something. Mm -hmm. But About basically, you. yeah. <laughs> at least, but but there's another but but to be absolutely honest, there's another thing. They're reacting to Gil Goldstein because they know Gil Goldstein. Mm -hmm. 
who's mm. my producer. Okay. Gil Goldstein is telling them, and he's telling us, hey, I'm producing this artist, a young guy. He's been with Prince for years. He's got an opportunity mm -hmm. to do his own thing. And this is what he's into. This is what we're going to try to do. And we want you to come in to do the session. And by the way, this is what it pays. Okay. Say that <laughs> part. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. said that, Alfonso and, and, and Alex were just absolutely fabulous. You know, they they took it to heart. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I mean, um, Alfonso Johnson is just one of the one of the nicest, most sweetest guys in the world. Professional, um, and and I I made sure to tell Gil. I said, tell Alfonso, please bring some music of his because I already knew Alfonso could be a wonderful writer for things that he had written and his contributions to Weather Report for the years that he was with that band. Mm -hmm. And this song, Two Sisters of his, um, I was just glad that he had never written it when he was still working with Weather Report. So I'm glad <laughs> they hadn't recorded it, you know, because to me, it's my favorite song on the album. I mean, beginning to end. Wow. Um, I just think mm -hmm. it's an absolutely incredible piece of music. And the basic arrangement of the song is, is his, but he gave me carte blanche to do all the horn orchestrations and harmonies with it. And for him to just say, hey, Eric, you know, here's the song. This is what we do. Go for it. Whatever else you want to do mm -hmm. with it, you know, and, and I'm, you know, that's 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 an attitude you really dig. Um, and and just, you know, being able and they were guys that would basically said, OK, OK, Eric. What do you need us to do for this song? What are you looking for? You know, so I mean, we're here to serve the music. So that, once again, that's 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 what you want. Um, hmm. And of course, the other thing was is it was a little odd for me because I still have to I still have to try to at least fake the attitude. This is my record, so it's going to be what I want. But right, you got to keep tell, you got to keep together. Tell, you know, I got to tell you, <laughs> I'm sitting there trying to mm -hmm. play this music, and I'm looking. And I said, "That's freaking Alfonso Johnson and Alejandro Cuna." <laughs> You know, so like it was like, oh, you know, I mean, these really, the, you know, these really are heroes of mine. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. so I actually want to ask this question from the chat because the chat goes by fast and I don't want to lose it. So the question is, I'm pretty sure Prince was not involved in the artwork of both solo albums, but did he, but did the designs go past him? Did he have to approve them? Did he have any remarks? Um, <laughs> I don't think he... Like I said, on Things Left Unsaid, I don't think he saw anything about that album until it was actually done, which would have included the, the, the artwork for that, obviously. Um, I don't remember at what point whether he had any, I don't think he had anything to do with, with the final artwork for Times Squared either. I suspect that, I don't know at what process it was actually shown to him, mm -hmm. you know? If if um, Times Squared might have been shown to him before, with you know, before it actually say went to press, so I assume that if there had been something about it that he really objected to, he would have let us know. But to be absolutely honest, I either don't remember or wasn't really involved in any discussions or or any aspect of that. But th things left unsaid, I'm pretty sure was just he got handed the finished product and said, "Oh, by the way, there it is." So <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so I was actually, you know, doing my Googles, as Michael Dean would say, and I actually did um, come across um, Santi Vega's Isla uh, Mujeres on his 1992 album of mm -hmm. the same title. And so do you know, I know that he wrote the song. Do you know if he recorded the specific version, I'm assuming after you recorded yours or? No, his, his, was, done, his, his was done before. Okay. Because that that's because that's what Gil brought me. Gil he said, listen to this song and see if Got this is something you, you know that you that you'd you'd like to try to do something with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And and one and once again, that that that's what makes an album like that so cool because like I said, I had a stack of my own music. Mm -hmm. I could have done a whole album of like, you know, ten songs of just my own stuff, but it was like I I you know, I need to broaden my world. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of this. So it was like Gil, bring me stuff. Um, the song on the album Soldier's Things, it's a, a song by Tom Waits. I'm familiar with Tom Waits, but, you know, Tom Waits wasn't somebody that I listened to a lot. 
And Gil's bringing me the song by Tom Waits. And I'm scratching my head. The Tom Waits song? So what the hell am I going to do with that? And he said, no, just listen to it. The lyrics on the song actually are absolutely wonderful. You don't get, obviously, you don't get the benefit of what the lyrics are from, from my version. And I listened to the song and it was like, wow. You know, and I thought immediately, I said, oh, this is something I really like to do on baritone. Not tend, you know, do it on baritone to give it a different character. And I looked at Gil. Gil, aside being from a, a keyboard player, is also a wonderful accordion player. And I happen to love accordion. I mean, a lot of people, Lawrence, well, corny ass shit. No, accordion is a beautiful freaking instrument. You hear it on Isla Mujeres. You hear it on Soldier Stings. Um, and I said, you know, this would really be a, a, a really cool thing. So it, it's, to this day, it's it's my favorite piece of music that I ever recorded on baritone saxophone. I, I just love the song and what we did with it. And that was Gill's arrangement. I mean, he basically said, okay, let me arrange it. He added some har some harmonic parts to it for the solo spot and everything. So basically I said, okay, I'll, you know, bring me what, what, what you're hearing on this and brought in. So this is what we did. Um, that's not a song that would have ever occurred to me to have done left of my own devices. So that's what you're looking for in a producer. That's, mm -hmm. that's maybe hearing something in me that I'm not going to hear. They said, I could maybe hear Eric doing something a little bit left, you know, left field that he wouldn't know. And so let me bring in this and see what that, and, and those are the things that you actually love because it puts me, it puts me in a different position than I'm going to be in just left of my own device. So it's, it's, it's like, let me see what I can do with stuff that isn't just coming from me. So. So I, I know you've already spoken a lot, uh, well, not a lot, but a little bit about Two Sisters. I want to play a little bit for our audience, and, um, and if you could talk some more about it, that would be lovely. So before we get into it, um, Nick Feldman actually has a question. Uh, what synths were used on both albums? Do you remember? Oh, God. Um, I would imagine. Well, let me see. Um, I probably used a Roland D50 on Times Squared only because I was using what, what instruments that were just at Paisley. Mm -hmm. I, used, I, I used to use a Prophet VS back in those days. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the synths that were used on Things Left Unsaid were Gil Goldstein's. And he he had, I don't know what he had. He had tons of stuff. In fact, um, he had a friend that came in that provided some of the synthesizer sounds. That was a guy who had done sound effects for the Alien movies. <laughs> wow. So, Yeah. And he, he came in with shit that was just like, oh, my God. In fact, um, the, the, la the last song on the album is called Commuting. And at the beginning and the end of the song, you hear a sound that sounds like kind of like a bus, you know, going down, going down the street. And that was sounds that this guy brought in, you know. And he said, well, here's a sound might be cool for this song. And I'm here and said, OK, why not? You know, that's, that's actually one of my favorite songs off the album is Commuting, and it's because of those bookends of those sound effects, because it really creates a mood for the song. Yeah, so th this is what this guy had. So, I, I mean, he had custom, you know, custom designed sounds of his own, which is why Gil brought him in. He said, well, you know, this guy does all kinds of unique sounds. So beyond, you know, beyond the more common instruments of that era, like I said, we're talking early 1990s. So whatever with you know like i said i remember there was the roland d50 that was a synth everybody was using back then prophet vs and some of the others i on the song um times gift there's a the synths on that i did most of that using my old arp odyssey which was a synthesizer dating back to the mid 70s that i still had and loved 
old analog synthesizer that I that I used on that. Um, other than that, it could have you know, Rhodes pianos got a lot of Rhodes pianos and things like that. Um, I, I want to make mention on two sisters, the the, the, pian the pianist on the record, um, David Budway, had been playing in my band. David Budway is a friend of mine from Pittsburgh. He has lived in New York, played in New York for years now. Um, is one of the finest and most well-respected jazz pian pianists in New York, has been for years. Um, his piano playing on, on the album is absolutely just superb. And particularly on Two Sisters during the out vamp, where all the horns um, are playing. Um, David is playing all these tremendous piano fills between between the horn lines. And it's just, it, it, it's just he's just kicking it and grooving it so hard with what he's playing on piano. It's just a absolutely you know, one of one of my favorite parts of the album is is, is what he brought. And he also he he's uh, the piano soloist on on Time's Gift also. So I want to mention to him because he, he he was still one of my dearest friends and one of the finest pianists I've I've ever worked with. So we're actually so speaking of commuting, I think commuting is the last song I have for Times Square that I wanted to talk about, and. Um, I do want to play that that part that you're talking about because I love it so. So um, let's give it a listen. <laughs> This is one of those songs I could listen. I could literally listen to it on repeat for 24 hours, and I would never get tired of it. It puts you in this—I don't know—this really beautiful mood that you just want to live there. So, uh, if do you mind talking about commuting? Um, yeah. For, first of all, I got to say that that to that extent, what really makes that song work more than anything else, Alejandro Acuna's drumming and percussion work on that. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely just phenomenal. And probably the closest that you're going to get on this album of really understanding why Alejandro Acuna was with Weather Report mm -hmm. for the years that he was with him, because <laughs> this was kind of, you know, that kind of a little closer to that kind of vibe than maybe anything else on the album. Um, the song I actually wrote back in the late 70s it was oh, a wow. song that i just yeah had, had i think i did a demo on a little demo on it with some friends of mine um mm -hmm. that's as far as it went so it was one of those things i just had in my back pocket and you know brought out and 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 gil goldstein he said yeah this is something that could, we could really do some cool things with um gil actually added some parts to it gil added um the harmonic progression that we use for the for the sa for the main saxophone solo um but the, you know it's it's because the song itself is rather simple and 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 it's just you know these kind of um long spread out chords that just kind of float that's the kind of song that <clears throat> is really made or or not made by what the band is going to do with it um and like i said both alfonso and and alex, alex were just superb on that so that that's they're, they're just kicking it. I mean, they're, they're just <laughs> grooving it into the ground. So, you know, that's that's really what makes that work. Um, there is one other song I would like to make mention of on the sure. album, a song that was called Yaunde. Hmm. Um, that was a song that it basically it started as, as a sequence that I had done um, and brought in with all, all of the basic keyboards and a lot of the percussion that was sample percussion that I had used to bring in. And just as a shell of a song, I said, what can we do with this? Anything we can do with this to give it something else. Um, Alejandro Acuna put on um, conga drums on it. There no, there, there's no trap set on it. He's just playing congas along with everything else. Um, Alfonso Johnson played an instrument called the Chapman Stick, which mm -hmm. is a, a, a guitar-like instrument that basically is fed through a synthesizer, and you can get all different kinds of sounds from it. Um, and he played it on that and gives this kind of droning sound to it, to the whole thing that really added another dimension. But here's where it really got interesting. We had basically what I thought that the song was basically done the way I wanted. And I was thrilled with it. I said, this is everything I want this song to be. 
When we got to New York, we had arranged for percussionist Mino Sanulu. Mino Sanulu was one of, and still is, just tremendous um, percussionist who, would, once again, had been a member of Weather Report. He had been Miles Davis's uh, percussionist for several years. So his, I was certainly aware of, of Mino's work. And, and Gil said, I can bring in Mino Sanulu. I said, please do. Hmm. Bring him on. So Mino came in to do, he actually added percussion on Two Sisters, some other songs. And we thought about, and, and, and Gil said, maybe you can add some things to Yonde. And I said, well, you know, there's an awful lot of percussion already on there. I don't know if there's any space for anything more. But Mino had listened to the song. He, Gil had, had given Mino the song. He said, listen to this and see if there's anything else you think you could bring to this. So Mina came in and he said, yeah, I've got some spots in there. I think I could add some things. So he started bringing out all these instruments. And, and a percussionist like that, he makes a lot of his own instruments. Hmm. He takes pieces of scrap metal and welds them together to make all kinds of odd things that have chime effects and bell sounds and, you know, just really cool, unique sounds. So he's got all of this stuff that he's bringing in. It looks like a scrapyard. But he lays it all out on the floor in the studio and you just roll the track. And this guy added all of these parts that filled in just all these little gaps that just added just another dimension to the song. Then he says to me, he said, Eric, I went so far and was bold to write lyrics for the song. <laughs> <laughs> From a standpoint of a jazz guy, I'm like, oh, oh you do, oh, you do, oh, 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 gee, isn't that wonderful? I wrote lyrics to my song. Oh, yeah, that's just what I want, lyrics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked and I said, they're not in English, are they? He said, oh, no, no. He said, Mino Sanulo is from, from the island of Martinique, which is basically the language of, of um, Martinique is basically a French Creole kind of thing. Mm. So he wrote the, 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 the lyrics in his native language. But I'm still thinking, I said, you know, that song, I don't need, I don't need some guy yodeling on this song you know mm -hmm. everything is just exactly where i want it now of course i got director's cut so it's like i'm, I'm just saying yeah go on yeah, sure sure why not throw it on there because if i don't like it it it's not going to be on the record you know so it's it's no, it's no big thing he starts singing and once again within 30 seconds i'm like <laughs> i thought i knew what this song was about I didn't have a clue. You know, within a minute, it's like, I can't imagine the song without these, without what he did vocally on it. It's absolutely just stunning and mm. brought a whole character to the song that I had written. And I thought, well, this is my song. Ain't no one gonna tell me what my song's about. Well, he did, he came in to just add in <laughs> another dimension to it. Once again, those are the situations that you find yourself in. And when you can sit back and, and have that and just learn something about your own music that you didn't know, those are the circumstances that I, lo that, that I love more than any other situation you can be in. And I just looked at them and I said, dude, man, thank you. Thank you so much for coming in and saying, oh, by the way, I got some lyrics for your song. You know, tell me what you got. Mm. And that... Those are the moments that, that, that you, you know, I treasure. You know, those are really the coolest moments in music for me. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up to what, you know, that kind of situation. And, and, and to be honest, what was so great for, of, of this album was there were a lot of moments like that. So anyway. So one, I forgot, there's one last question I want to ask about things left unsaid. So on Prince Vault, I read that technically Pacemaker was originally recorded to be on Things Left Unsaid, but yep. it says that you didn't like it. Um, yep. Can you yep. talk we, to, yeah. There, there, were, there were a couple other songs that we did for, for the album that, that didn't make it. Um, Pacemaker was one. It was cool. It just wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted the song to be. It was just a little bit off. Um, and we didn't need it. You know, by the time we really had everything else together, I said, you know, you know, if I'd really been adamant about it, we might have been able to rework it. But I said, you know, it's not exactly where I want it to be. We don't need it. I also did a version, uh, a recorded a version of Prince's song, Venus de Milo. Oh. The, the, the piano, you know, the piano instrument yeah. from, mm -hmm. from the parade mm -hmm. album. 
What? And um, and basically, uh, I, I just used a tenor and flute playing in unison the basic melody part of it. Um, hmm. The reason I didn't use it is because I liked that song too much. And what I ended up doing with it, really, I mean, I love, I love what, what we, what, what, how it ended up. I mean, I've, I've got, you know, I've got my own rough mix on it that I listen to occasionally. I said, boy, it really sounds great. It really worked. Hmm. But there was nothing about it that added anything that you wouldn't have already heard or felt from Prince's version. Mm. So it was basically like all I did was a reading of the song. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was really cool, but it was like there was no point to it, you know, mm -hmm. because if if all I could think of it is, boy, it really sounds pretty. You know, I had really my, my flute sounded great that day. Everything, you know, everything, the phrasing, everything. But at the end of the day, it was like, eh, I don't really need to listen to this any more than I would want to listen to Prince's original version of it. Mm. So what we actually did then is Gil Goldstein wrote a completely different arrangement for the song, a completely different treatment for it mm. that we recorded in New York, which I didn't like. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> what came down, I said, Gil, eh, no, love you, but we'll put this one aside. By then, we had already decided that the obligatory radio song was going to be the the tears for fear song that we did women in chains mm. which we had already done mm -hmm. and i said you know once again this is what we got i think we have an album we're cool so you know awesome so we're going to transition to times square but eric i want to make sure do you have water you got water i was going to say like make sure you have water because of i'm good I, yeah okay awesome <laughs> So we're going to play one of my favorite songs off of Times Squared. Um, it is such an amazing opener for any album. And um, we're talking about lines. <laughs> Everybody should know about lines. And we're going to play a little bit. But I, wanted, but I read that this was actually the last song that you recorded for the album. Uh -huh. And then also, it is all you. But every time I listen to it, particularly the keyboards, I don't know, I think of Prince, even though I know it's all you. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, like, um, how did you go about, like, why did you write this? Is there something that, that you intentionally wanted to have as an opener for the album and you didn't feel like you had an opener? Can you talk a little bit, like, set it up for us? Uh, the song was a complete afterthought. First of all, the song I had written and played in my band, no, never, never played it, but it was a song that I had written for my band in Pittsburgh back in 1978. So I have only some rehearsals of the basic groove. The song was never really developed beyond that. It was just a basic groove and, and that I had. Once again, it was just something that was in my back pocket. Um, when... We were working on, and when finishing up Times Squared, um, we had decided that there needed to be one, we needed one more song. And the song Aguadilla on Things Left Unsaid, I had done a previous version of wow. for, Times, for, for Times Squared. Got it. And the song then was called Portofino, a different title. I called it Portofino. And the reason I didn't use the original version when it came time to do things left unsaid is once again, Gil Goldstein listened to the original version. He said, you know, it's cool, but it could use something else to it. And he said to me, he said, I know you love um, Afro-Cuban music. Why don't you put in a Montuno, ver you, you know, add something to it that goes into a more strictly salsa kind of thing to it, which I did on Aguadilla. Halfway through the song, it has a breakdown and it goes into a Montuno. Bang, 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 you know, all that stuff. So that wasn't on the original version when I called it Portofino. So I had recorded the song Portofino, but still wasn't completely sold on it for Times Square. So I said, you know, what the hell? Let me take this old groove that I've been sitting on for over 10 years and see if I can do something with that. So that's why Lines came into it. Um, Lines is the only song on that album that was entirely mine, mm -hmm. by the way. 
Mm -hmm. you know, everything else on that album had been music um, that was came from the vault, you know, unfinished music of Prince's that he had basically given me. He said, here's a whole bunch of songs in the vault. Take any of this and do whatever you want with it. The only thing that, that had been completed was Dopamine Rush, mm -hmm. which was originally like a 17 minute piece that I took a knife to and basically said, I like this. I don't like that. I like this. I don't like that. That's out and compress it down to about six and a half, seven minutes. And that's what went on, went on the album. Um, but lines was an afterthought. It was like I said, it was like, okay, we need one more thing to see. Let's see if this works. So, and at that point, um, I didn't have the time to um, find the musicians that I would have probably have liked to have worked with me on, on lines. I, I basically went into it starting as like, well, let me do a demo of this and see if I can take it from there. But by the time I got done with it and Prince liked and Prince heard it and he said, no, I think this is cool the way it is. I said, all right, I'll take your word for it. So that's, that's once again, boss, the boss is happy. I'm happy. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually my favorite song off Times Square. We're going to play a little oh, bit wow, of it. Okay. And then um, I want to ask you one more question. And then if it, there's anything else you want to say about it. So let's listen to my one of my favorite songs of all time. <laughs> So one of the things I love about the song is the percussion. Um, and obviously, you know, the horn lines are just bananas. Um, I wanted to ask, I noticed that it was um, co-written by Atlanta Bliss or Matt Bliston, mm -hmm. but he didn't perform on it. So it sounds like you just, he wasn't, um, you know, around or you didn't have time to call Went him around. in. The reason he has a composing credit on it is there's one part of a, of a long synthesizer part was a kind of an organ sound that was a transcription of a solo that matt had played on a live recording of a song that we had done in our band back in pittsburgh in the late 70s mm -hmm. from 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 just a, from a, a gig that we were doing he was playing this wonderful trumpet solo and i happened to have heard it and i said boy why don't i transcribe that and throw it in the middle of of this so wow. You had to really know your music to, I mean, to be able to pull something like that from a performance from years ago and then use it later. Like you obviously are archive, you archive everything, I would imagine. <laughs> I am the supreme egotist. I listen to a lot, of, I listen to a lot of my own music. <laughs> hey, I'm not mad at that. <laughs> the, the, the band that I, I had a band in Pittsburgh from for about a year and a half, some 77 to 78, called Taken Names. And Matt was in that band with me. Um, and that's where I learned to be the musician that I wanted to be. I mean, we were basically a cover band. You know, basically, I mean, we were an R&B funk cover band. We were a bar band. We played, you know, in the year and a half that that band was together, we played almost 375 gigs. I'm going to play five, six nights a week, week after mm -hmm. week after week, um, just in the local bars in, in, in Pittsburgh. It was an eight-piece band. Um, to this day, it was still maybe my favorite band I was ever in. Now, of course, mm -hmm. it was my band, so mm -hmm. that that has something mm -hmm. to, to do with it. Mm -hmm. But um, but it was where I learned and had the opportunity to to grow as an arranger, as a as a writer, as a player, and everything. Mm -hmm. And it was a great time to be a, a R and B funk cover band because you mm -hmm. had Stevie Wonder at his best. You had Earth, Wind, and Fire at their best. Mm -hmm. You had George Clinton, Parliament, Funkadelic at their best. You had AWB at Cool and the Gang. Wow. You had all of that, you know, Isley yeah. Brothers. And that was what we were. But we used to take that music and try to do all different kinds of things with it, you know? Mm -hmm. And the cool thing was then, as long as you kept the people on the dance floor, we could play on top of the groove anything we wanted pretty much. And that's what we did. And we also did um, our own music. Now, our own music was almost entirely instrumental stuff and more fusion-y, weather report kind of stuff. But in the clubs back in those days, 
we wouldn't start playing till 10 30 at night we'd play from 10 10 30 at night until two you know like maybe three you know 15 minute sets mm. the first set the people are just coming in and that's where the people want to listen so we could play more of the you know more the instrumental more the jazzy kind of stuff the first set Okay. By the time we're hitting the second sentence, it's about 11, 30, 12. Then you got the place packed and it's all the dancers. So now we're just to groove you to death. But we right. could take a Cool the Gang song like Open Sesame, mm. and we could sit on that for 10 minutes. Wow. And we could just, and and Matt, Matt Blissen, he played electric trumpet. He had a trumpet going through a wah-wah pedal like Miles was doing back then. And we would just keep that groove going and give, give it to Matt and just let him play some shit. And I'm playing keyboards mm. in that band besides the horn. So, like I said, as long as we kept the folks on the dance floor, we were, you know, we were, so so that's where things like lines come from, because we might just segue into that groove and just Mm. stay on that and just like play all kinds of stuff over it. So those are, you know, and I've got, I've got a lot of, of, of recordings, live recordings of that band, Really, you know, so, so that's kind of was my you know, my source for a lot of stuff going years later, mm-hmm. I could always go, eh, see if see, I find something we did. Oh, that was cool. Let me see if I can take that and maybe develop it. You know, so that mm-hmm. that's, yeah. Well, was there ever a talk of you and Atlanta Bliss being a group? Like before you, before I became Eric Lee's solo or, or even a part of Madhouse, I was curious why it didn't seem like he was, um, well, like I say, we, we, we played together in so many bands, we, you know, Matt and I started playing together. We went, we, we were in music school together. So we knew each other back then, the early seventies, we started playing together in a lounge band in 1975 with a, with a, a singer piano player, you know, basically playing like holiday in hotel lounges where you're playing old standards and contemporary stuff. And you're doing med- medleys of stuff like Jesus Christ, superstar, you know, I mean, stuff like that. But you're playing, you're playing four or five hours a night, six mm-hmm. nights a week, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and doing a lot of old standards. And that's where, where Matt and I got our shit together. Right. right so right. years, you know, years later, we had these bands that we had together. Um, after we were w- w- with Prince, Matt moved, left, town, left Minneapolis and went back to Atlanta. I mean, he's from Pittsburgh. But he was living in Atlanta. He moved back to Atlanta, and he's he's been back in Pittsburgh for years. Matt Matt doesn't doesn't play professionally any longer. has hasn't mm-hmm. for years. Um, he had actually in 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 the early '80s he had a band of his own in Pittsburgh called the Parker Brothers, which was a very very popular bar band also. Okay. Um, so no, we we never really you know the opportunity never really presented itself for him and I to really have like a group that was just going to be based around the two of us, you know, because basically I was a leader. And he was a leader too, mm-hmm. you know, when it came down mm-hmm. to doing his own thing. So, yeah. Gotcha. yeah. So the next song I want to talk about from Times Square is my second favorite, and then it's Kenya. I want to play a little bit first. We got Prince on drums. We couldn't talk over that part. <laughs> so, we got Atlanta Bliss on trumpet. We got Larry Frantangelo on percussion. And this is another song that was written by you, Eric. So talk to us about Kenya, please. Well, the, the basic the basic track was just Prince on drums and myself playing the, the lead tenor. Um, it was recorded during the sessions for the second Madhouse album, for, Mad, for Madhouse 16. Mm-hmm. Um Sheila was, you know, Sheila was the drummer on much of about half of of Madhouse 16. Levi Caesar was on bass on most of it. Um, But during during the sessions, um, one afternoon, we were taking a break and Prince just hollered and said, hey, Eric, grab your horn. And Prince got on drums and started just playing that that groove. And he said, just just play whatever, just you you and me, just extemporaneous stuff. And we, you know, might have gone on for four or five minutes or whatever. And that and and that was it. it Just the two of us. That and that went in 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 the can, went in the vault. Um, 
when it comes time for me to be working on the music for Times Square, um, Prince had reminded me about that. He said, listen, listen to that thing that you and I did and see if there's anything there that, that you know, you think you could. And I, I listened to it. I said, well, you know, I mean, it's Prince playing a nice groove. I'm not playing anything of any great value on it. I'm, I'm just honking and squealing, really, <laughs> you know. Um, I love it, Eric. <laughs> but no, I mean, you, you know, it, it was just, you know, there's no harmonic content because there's no chordy instruments. So I'm just playing whatever. But I thought about it. I said, you know, maybe this is something for me to try to show off as an arranger. Mm -hmm. So I took I took it and, and I spent about two days on that um, trying to find some kind of har harmonic anchor that I could then construct a horn arrangement around. And basically the, ins the, the, the I don't say ins um, inspiration is maybe too hyperbolic a word. Um, it's my attempt to try to do a Duke Ellington kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Duke mm -hmm. Ellington um, wrote music that was very similar to that back in the 1930s. I mean, there was a there was a, a piece that he called the Liberian Suite, and then there was an also a, another one that he called the Harlem Suite, hmm. that, that were long form pieces of music, um, and I went and listened to those, you know, to try to get an idea. I said this is something it it it, it the kind of Afro beat that Prince was playing kind of reminded me a little bit of the kind of things that Duke Ellington was doing back in the 1930s and 40s. And I said, you know, maybe I can try to construct something around it that is, you know, that will kind of pur purposely remind me of that. So that's basically what it was. It was just, just me trying to, to write something that, that um, trying to be Duke Ellington. So that's, that's not an easy thing to do. No, so, no definitely you know. not. Definitely not. So there's a question in the chat and I'm going to ask the question and then I'm going to spin it a little bit too. And, um, you know, does Mr. Lee's remember if he and Prince ever discussed African music in any way? And my twist on that is, did you and Prince talk about Duke Ellington um, at any point? Yeah, we used to talk about Duke Ellington. We never talk about African music. You know, one thing that I always regret is that Prince didn't talk about music a lot. Hmm. I mean, in the manner that I would be talking mm. about music, which is a good thing in Wenry because, you know, Prince was too busy doing music. Mm -hmm. than to talk about it. But mm -hmm. the kind of conversations that I would have with, you know, so many musicians that I'm close to or whatever, one of my dearest friends in music is is, is Christian McBride. <laughs> you know, um, in fact, Christian was just in town a few weeks ago and we had dinner, my, my brother and I, we've known each other for years. Christian, first of all, is a James Brown fanatic. I mean, work with James Brown. I mean, great jazz bass player, but I mean, the kind of conversations that I would have with 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 a Christian McBride or with Branford Marcellus is an all, all, also a very good friend of mine. And the guys that I grew up with, those are the kind of conversations you'd have with Prince about music. Because unfortunately, Prince could not ever detach himself from himself. So the conversation always was going to be from the perspective of Prince and his music, hmm. which was fine, but it still wasn't there was never going to be some objectivity to it beyond a certain extent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes he could get them close, but he wasn't ever going to go too far off script. Um, I knew he was aware of Duke Ellington because his father was just a Duke Ellington fanatic, of course. Mm -hmm. But I, I, this is, <laughs> Okay, I, I have to, I'm gonna have to be careful about this story because I really don't want to offend the Prince, you know, crowd. But I think they'll I, I think they'll, they'll understand this. If I try to put it in this context. There's an old phrase that says, "No good deed goes unpunished." Yes, you heard that, right? Yes. All right. So I gave Prince an album. I said, "Of all the Duke Ellington stuff that you might never have been aware of, more than anything else, this is what I'm sure you." would absolutely love. And I gave Prince a copy of Duke Ellington at Newport. Which is mm -hmm. a famous concert from 1956 where the centerpiece of the recording of the, of the concert was a piece that Duke Ellington had written back in the 30s called Diminuendo and Crescendo in Blue. 
the thing goes on for about 20 minutes. And in the midst of it, it's just really a blues, you know, just with this, all this tremendous orchestration as only Duke Ellington could write. But in the middle of it is a saxophone solo by a guy named Paul Gonzalez, who was a tenor saxophone player, played almost his entire career as a member of Duke Ellington's band. And he had the solo spot in this. He ended up playing 27 consecutive blues choruses, a solo that really went probably seven or eight minutes. Mm -hmm. And the story is that this was an outdoor concert, Newport Jazz Festival, Newport, Rhode Island, back in those days, in front of a crowd of maybe five, 6,000 people. During that concert, the crowd went nuts. On their feet, dancing. This is a jazz crowd. This is what jazz crowds do. But this, they were grooving this thing and swinging it so hard that the crowd just absolutely went bonkers. And by the time they get into the out chorus and the out vamp where the, where the trumpets are screaming at top octaves, it's, it's one of the most iconic and amazing performances in the history of American music. I mean, it really, it is something that cannot be overhyped. So I gave this record to Prince and Prince absolutely just loved it. So when we're, com when we're working on Madhouse 16, there's a song on, on that album. I think it's 12, which was the last song on side one of the album. We're talking vinyl, you know. Mm -hmm. Prince wrote this song and it was 12. And it was obviously his attempt to write something in a Duke Ellington vein. Hmm. Personally, I didn't think the song was very good. I thought it was really corny. My own personal opinion. The problem, though, is that Prince played drums on this song. Once again, this is a, this is a jazz swing feel kind of a triple meter, you know, when you think of jazz, tink, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Prince can't swing. He can't swing. You know, I mean, it's it's like, as a guitar player, he can kind of fake it because he's such, a, such an incredible guitar player. But as a drummer, he does not know how to swing. He cannot physically play a jazz swing groove. His high, his his ride symbol is straight up, what we call straight eights, which is what mm -hmm. funk and R and B is. Mm -hmm. The basic pulse of a swing groove is the hi hat opening and closing, closing on two and four. Throughout this entire song, Prince is hi hat is opening and closing on one and three. That's Lawrence Welk, kind of, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Now. <laughs> I will always preface when I make a comment about anything and say, this is my opinion. Mm -hmm. In other words, I am not suggesting that you are supposed to have any opinion other than your own. You're asking me a question, I'm answering it. I have no agenda here. I am not trying to talk you out of digging something you dig because maybe it's something I don't dig. You understand? Yep. And vice versa. There's a lot of music that I've made that maybe you don't want to hear. <laughs> Fine. Oh. I got better things to try to talk you into digging something that you don't dig. It's a big world, you know. But I'm. But in this case, I'm putting that aside. I brook no opinion. This song is god awful. <laughs> Are you talking about the? Oh, that's exactly what he's talking about. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Eric, I broke no exactly opinion. What about. That song is god awful. Now, mm -hmm. da, da, if. <laughs> If, if Sheila had played drums on it, at least it would have swung. Now, Sheila's yeah. swing is not like a Jimmy Cobb, Elvin Jones jazz, but she uh -huh. can swing. Uh -huh. Girl uh -huh. knows how to, you know. Uh -huh. Prince can not swing. It's just something he does not possess the physical ability to do. And I'm sorry, through the whole... My one contribution to that album was basically when he's mixing that song and I'm in booth with him and I'm sitting there and I said, oh my God, this is like, please Lord, make it stop. So I said to him, I said, Prince, can I suggest something? And he said, yeah, sure. And I reached over the board and I muted the hi-hat microphone. I just mm -hmm. muted it. 
Now, you still hear it because it bleeds over into the other microphones that are close to the snare drum microphone. But at least that hi-hat closing on, bah, 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 on one and three is not as loud as it was going to be. And that's all I could do. But mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's, it's just... Now, but here's the thing. If you flip the album over mm -hmm. and go to the last track, the title track, 16... It's a song that Prince and I had put together sometime before we even did those sessions. It's not a great song, but it's okay, you know. But what's cool about it is Prince is playing drums on that. And that's a straight up kind of straight eighth Billy Cobham kind of groove. Prince plays his ass off mm -hmm, on that mm -hmm, song. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. what's cool. The song is not as interesting as just his groove. It gets into the outvamp of that, and Prince is killing it. I mean, just burning his fills. The groove is just killing. That's the difference. That's where he lives. When you watch him walk down the street, that's how he walks. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> when you flip it over with the swing groove, uh-uh. That's not how he, that's not where his physicality in the music is, you know? And it was a rare occasion where he insisted on trying to do something. I'm sorry, dude. This ain't for you. You know. So you know, like I'm saying it's now, you know, you flip the script. There's an awful lot of music that I love that I'm not going to pretend to say, oh, I can do that. I love it. But mm -hmm. I, I'm going to try to do that. That's not what that's not what I do. So anyway, I, I it, it's just. It's just a funny thing because you asked me about Duke Ellington, and whenever I think of Duke Ellington, I think about this. Oh, I got, I got to go into that, <laughs> you know, because because I turned him on to that damn Newport. And he, he insists on trying to do it. I said, "Oh, do please, oh, don't do that. Just let let it alone. Leave it alone, please." Can I, can I make one small point? Sure. So just 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 for the audience to sure. give the context of of, of swing, um, there's an album. There are so many albums, but there's an album. It's by Art Blakey. Mm -hmm. It's called Free For All. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, well. Four songs on it. Yeah. The last song, Pensativa. 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 Thank yeah. you. Claire, written, by Claire, I, written by Claire Fisher. I didn't know that, but that's right. I did not know that. It's song. It's yeah, song. okay. Yeah. Uh, but, the, yeah. but, but, what... What Mr. Lees is talking about with the swing and the swing beat, is, again, it's a, it's a slower tempo, but what you hear Art Blakey play on that song in particular mm -hmm. is, an, to me, a very, very good example of a classic swing beat. And oh, when sure. Blakey comes up under you, he, you, you, he carries that whole band and he plays straight tempo well, all the way through and you've got Bla Freddie Blakey, Hubbard slow, I mean, soloing yeah. on it. You've got Wayne Shorter slow, uh, soloing oh, yeah, on it. Curtis yeah. Fuller. Well, that's that, excellent. The title, the title track, if you listen to title track Free For All, which was Wayne Shorter's song, mm, mm -hmm. if you listen to that, particularly if you put on earphones, during the middle of it, you hear the band screaming while some of the solos on, you hear the castle, ah! Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they are like, wow. Yeah. They are just like, you know, they are so, it is one that it, it, I mean, I probably got, I probably got 40 or 50 yard Blakey albums. I mean, just pre, yeah. you know, pretty much everything he ever played on Blue Note, pretty much everything. Yeah. That yeah. is probably one of his two or three of my absolute favorite albums that he ever, yeah. all, no, that album is just absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Now like you talk, said. yeah, you talk about swing. Yeah, yeah right. you can. You, you know, all you need to put in the dictionary next to it, put the words Art Blakey. Yeah, you got that. Yeah. yeah. And the conversational aspect to jazz, because that's what he's talking about. I mean, it, it, that's not the only song where you can hear people talking and, 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 and encouraging other musicians. Oh yeah, to yeah. Blow your horn and and, and oh, what's, oh, yeah, what's really happening is that there's this conversation. Absolutely. What they're responding to vocally is what they're hearing musically. Abs absolutely. Yeah. So I, I mean, you know, once again, I mean, I don't, I don't want people to think that I'm, I'm, I'm putting Prince down for that. Because oh yeah, like we want to keep you it's, alive. It's like in, in, in the in the broader context of things, it's like whether or not Prince can swing is really irrelevant. And it doesn't because, preclude like, him being a genius. Yeah, because you, you know you don't <laughs> listen to Little Red Corvette and say can't, can't swing. They got nothing mm -hmm. to do with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I say, if you really want to hear what he can do as a musician, listen to Sixteen. 
just do me a favor, pass on 12. Because, <laughs> you know, we, we all got our moments where oh, I leave that. <laughs> anyway. So I want to talk about another song, sorry, I did it since, and um, that wasn't on the CD, but it's actually on, um, I'm sorry, it's on the CD, no, but sorry, wasn't on, on the album. CD, yeah. yeah. It was on the CD, but it wasn't on the album, because like when we started playing Times Square, I actually pulled out my album, and I was like, where's Overnight Every Night? And, I, and I'm assuming it's just because, you know, back then, time, album time. only, yeah, time, right? Yep. yep. So um, let me play just a little for people who may not have heard this. All right, so this was composed by Prince Eric Leeds, Levi Cecil Jr., and Sheila E., according to the liner notes. And we obviously have Eric Leeds on the horns, Alana Bliss on the trumpets, Prince on the piano organ, Levi on the bass, Sheila on the drums. Talk to us about Overnight Every Night. Well, once again, first of all, we're talking about a swing group. That's kind of a quasi swing group. I mean, it's not like, a, you know, it's not like a classic, but it's still more of a closer to a triplet feel. And that's Sheila on drums. So like mm -hmm. that, that little, that, that groove, she can do that. You know, that's where she lives. So that, that's what makes, you know, that, that song work. Um, that was a song that once again, that was from um, the sessions that yielded Madhouse 16. That was a leftover that we didn't use on Madhouse 16. So when it was, uh, so I was working on Times Square and I went back to some of those things and, and, and said, uh, okay, maybe I can do something with that. So I wrote some extra horn parts, harmonized the melody, and, and then uh, Matt Bliston came in and overdubbed the trumpets when, when I fleshed it out with, with, with the horn arrangement that I put on it. So, Thank you for that. And uh, Michael, do you mind queuing up your dopamine rush? Is that possible? Yeah. So nice. we were going to play um, a little bit of dopamine rush, and while um, Michael is setting that up, um, this is com um, composed by Eric Leeds, at least according to the line that's, notes. That's that's wrong. That's wrong. That's is it? And, and and yeah. And let me, let me look at the. Let me look at. I the, mean, me I'm look. Like, I'm looking at my liner notes. No, oh, if okay, that's wrong, it. I put it in wrong. It says composed by Prince. That you're right. Yeah, that, that one. That was Prince. Yeah, yeah, I, I have um, all the wrong information on this one for some reason. I must have copied it and didn't go it. So let me read actually. It's um, yeah, Eric Leeds is on tenor and baritone flute. Prince synthesizes guitar, bass, drum, and percussion programming. Matilda May, voice, Claire Fisher, string arrangement. Yeah. So, yeah, I forgot. I must have copied this and forgot to change it. So, my apologies. Uh, are you ready with the cue? I'm ready. Are All right. You? Let's do it. Yes. Well, and that's a slightly different. Yeah, that's the part you said you uh, you cut out there, Eric. Yeah, it, 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 it did that. I just I didn't care for it. Just I, I, I the sound of it just it just didn't work for me. Yeah, I I didn't think that the that a vocalization of that nature added anything to to it. Um, I thought the melody was so pretty, just as it was. Um, so, you know, and, and I, you know, I always re reserve the right to change my mind on another day, maybe I would have said, no, <laughs> then, but, but I, um, you know, that, that originally was like a 16 or 17 minute um, piece, you know, went to a bunch of different things. Um, I was, I was, I was a little reluctant when, when, you know, when I did the edit of it, 
knowing that doing something that Prince was giving me carte blanche to do on another piece of music or something that he had never finished is one thing. But to take a finished piece of music of his and then edit it and then give it to him, give it to him, said, oh, by the way, here's your 17 minute piece that I've, cho that I've chopped up and, and it's now about six and a half minutes. Um, so I was like, eh, okay, we'll see what, you know, see what, see what happens with this. Um, fortunately, he, he, he actually, I, I was kind of surprised, but he said, you know something? Works a lot better this way. Keep it. Well, all right. So, I, you know, dodge that bullet. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I was, when, when I listened to that, I, I, I think of that, that of, of everything about that, the, the, the basic groove, the drum machine, particularly the, the drum machine pattern they came up with, not only the melody, but the textures of, of the synthesizers that he would use. To mm -hmm. me, a track like that is quintessential prints. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's, mm -hmm. you know, you know I, I don't think you're going to really, you know, listen to that. If you're, if you're familiar with Prince's music, you listen to that as, oh, that's Prince. Right. Um, was really, we were really kind of hoping that that was going to really get some radio attention for the album. Because, I mean, you like mm -hmm. to have a radio-friendly song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When the album came out, the album came out in 1991. Um, mm -hmm. It was the absolute peak of what's known as the smooth jazz era. When mm -hmm. Kenny G and... Uh, God, I can't remember some of the other players that, you know, that were really... Dave Cox? Dave Cos? Dave, Dave Cos. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Gerald Albright was one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Some others that selling millions and millions of records um we were kind of hoping that maybe this song we you know we we did a single edit we did like a three 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 and a half minute you know radio edit for the song also um and the feedback that we that that we got from radio programmers and everything was oh that drum machine is weird mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. i'm thinking oh really i said oh well then i can't help you on that you know, mm. that's what it is, you know, and, and you realize that so much of that music was so formulate, you know, so formula at that point and that anything that anyone would think is out of the ordinary. And it's just, it, you know, it's a it's a it's, it's a very imaginative use of, of the drum patterns. Really cool. But it's like it grooves. That's mm -hmm. the important thing. Mm -hmm. Does it feel good? Mm -hmm. Feel great. So like, don't tell me. Oh, it's weird. And then once I said, "Oh, I said, oh, we got we got problems now," you know, because <laughs> if they're listening to that, and mm -hmm. they're gonna just like say, "Oh, this this, this is weird," and I said, "Well, you, you know, pretty much the rest of the album isn't gonna isn't gonna get a lot of airplay on these stations." So, I find that odd because these are some of the same stations that actually played six, not four or five I years know. earlier. Yeah, but the six, same stations. Yeah, but six was. Yeah, like the live six drum was, and roll. Six, six, yeah, six was live drum and it was more, more of an R and B groove. I mean, it, mm -hmm. you know, the thing, the the, ra the radio. I I don't know. You, you know, you can yeah, always yeah, say yeah. the difference in five years. You know, right, we were thinking right. that maybe dopamine rush would work on Quiet Storm, particularly. Mm -hmm. Uh uh. No, mm -hmm. it 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 got no traction at all. Just go go figure. And it could have been one of those things that if that same song had been released two or three years early or two or three years later, who knows? They say timing is everything. Whatever it was, we could get no traction from it at all. I just wonder, and and I mean, it's like I'm living on this soapbox, but it's like, was there backlash by radio programmers of that format to say that, oh, well, wait a minute, Prince really isn't jazz, which is dumb and amazingly ironic because neither is Kenny G. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um. I don't know. What what yeah. I do know is that back in those days, radio programmers were would play bits and pieces of music for a sample audience, mm -hmm. and that they would take mm -hmm. their make their decisions based on that. And literally, from what I understood, they might play no more than like fifteen to thirty seconds of a song to get the immediate reaction from what they thought was their identifying mm -hmm. as their core audience, mm -hmm. and whatever it was. They, they, you know, they just weren't, we, we got no positive, you know, very little positive feedback. In mm. fact, the, the song on that album that actually got more consistent radio play than anything else um, was a song called Night Owl. <laughs> that got some radio play, you know. Um, 
bump, bump, ba da ba da ba da da. It's got a little, you know, funny little, you know, just a very That's cute my favorite little melody, album. you know. Um, yeah, but but we we really, you know, we really just thought that, and because dopamine rush was so identifiably Prince, you know, <laughs> more so yeah. than anything else, just the <clears> throat> character throat> of the song that we were hoping that that would gain some traction. Um, now, to, to, to your point about the more traditional jazz market having that, that obstinate refusal to want to accept somebody like Prince as a legitimate jazz artist, mm -hmm. which is why Prince did not want his name associated with Madhouse. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. You know? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, is that very little of the jazz press, like, for example, Downbeat Magazine, which was still, you know, the mm -hmm. main jazz publication, mm -hmm. never reviewed either of the Madhouse albums. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. was no mention of mm -hmm. it, you know, other than maybe a blurb that, you know, Paisley Park Prince has some new project called Mad. That was the extent of it. Um, when Times Square came out, um, Downbeat did a, a, a one column profile on me. Mm, you know, mm, on one page, mm. not a full story, just a you know, little one column profile. When, when, but they did not review Times Square. They did review things left unsaid. And I was very, very gratified. They, they gave it a really gave it a four star review, which I was mm. very, very yeah. happy with. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a question in the chat um, re regarding um, Dopamine Rush. Did Prince sing any more besides those two minutes on the song or was it just an intro? Because we only have like two minutes of. I I, th I think that I think that was it. I, I think that was 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 pretty much it. There might have been. Um, I don't. I, I I think that was it. I might be wrong. You know, there might okay. have been something in one of the other parts that he did, but I I don't recall. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit, and um, I want to we. So we're reading Dwayne's book, and uh, this year we're we're in the year of 1983, and Prince has been rehearsing Body Heat with the Revolution. And oh, God, my yeah. question to you was, of all James Brown's songs, why Body Heat? And the reason why I say Body Heat is that he rehearsed it a lot, and whenever he did rehearse it, it was for very long hours. And then it seems like I he... have, yeah, go ahead. yeah, I have played that groove with him at 15, 20 minutes. And I have to be absolutely honest, anytime we would hit that groove 15, after 20 minutes, I'm saying, that's 20 minutes of my life I'll never get back. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what it was about. And here's the thing, he would groove on what was actually the bridge of the song. And there was a little clavinet line on the bridge of, the, yeah. of, of, of James's original, that bang, 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 ka -dang, bang, 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 ka -dang. and that's what he wanted me to play. So literally for 15 minutes, I'm just like, bad, 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 bad. <laughs> and it's like, okay, thank you very much. You know, I really don't know what it was about that particular groove that he fell in love with. Body okay. Heat as a song is 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 unimportant to James Brown song as anything else you could you know come up with in this catalog. It was just, you know, it, it yeah. was a nothing of a song. But it seems in, like in my, in my, in my, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like Prince was really obsessed with it because he played it so I much. Guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my, my counterpoint to that, it, it seems like he switched, you know, when once the with the Sunny Times Love Sexy rehearsals, he sort of expanded the JP, J, um, JB rehearsal repertoire and um, there's like a Mother Popcorn uh, yep. rehearsal and Cold Sweat obviously was performed a lot with Bonnie Boyer and Bonnie's birthday was this past year, uh, past week. So if you have any oh, wow. yeah. Bonnie stories and also um, can you talk a little bit about um, why maybe he didn't drill the Sign of Times Love Sexy band on Body Heat and chose others? Maybe Prince himself got tired of Body Heat or? Well, I, 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 sus I suspect he did. You know, it was just one of those things he was into. It was, it was you know, I, don't, I really don't think it was anything more than just a convenient groove that he could hit on a sound mm -hmm. check in order for just to, for him to play on for a while. I, I think it was just, you know, we, we could hit a bunch of just generic 
R&B funk grooves, you know, at any time. And Body Heat just happened to be one of them. And it was, I, I think, maybe just convenient more than anything else. I, um, I'm, you know, I never had a discussion with him about it. Otherwise, it, it, you know, it was just something that during that time, there were a lot of sound checks. And in the, in the midst of a sound check, he would just hit that groove. And I said, OK, here we go. <laughs> time for Body Heat. <laughs> So I, I really don't. I really, you know, don't, don't, don't know if it had any significance to him beyond that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sure all of you had like Pavlovian responses whenever he said body. Uh, a lot of that. Yep. yep. Body. <laughs> <laughs> So continuing, we've been talking a lot about James Brown, and um, actually, I think last week or maybe the, the week before, we talked about the Star Time box set, which I got in real time like back, I think it was in 91 when it was released mm -hmm. or something yeah. like that. Um, and in the liner notes, um, it actually said, um, Alan said that, you know, he was going to write a forthcoming book about um, like a discography or chronology of James Brown. And I was lamenting um, that, you know, um, Alan didn't write that book. He, I know he wrote another book, but not the chronology, kind of like the studio sessions, because I did not realize until this very week, because I've been doing some research, that there's this whole James Brown, the single series, which Alan Leeds does all the liner notes for. It was like 11 mm -hmm. um, volumes, mm -hmm. and that's, you find the chronology in that. But the yep. reason why I'm talking about it with you is that, that in the credits, um, Alan thanks you. And, and on some of the albums, he always puts something in between your name. So like on volume four, he says <laughs> Eric Yosis leads. And then on volume seven, it's like Eric Counterpoint leads. So I'm sure there's like an inside joke. Um, that, like, can you like fill us in on what's going on here with the, the liner notes and thank you yeah. you? Some of it's just like inside inside jokes and references to to James Brown himself, and a lot of it is just a comment that I might have made about a particular song that he might have asked me about. Um, mm -hmm. And beyond that, I I really don't really remember too much, you know, too much of too much about this, you know, the specific the specific ones. Um, but yeah, it, it, that 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 is an amazing series of cds when you consider the, 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 the detail um that they went into because they're they, they they literally would include alternate versions and alternate releases and give and alan you know explained all of the, the different details about why a particular song might have been released in this form and it might have been pulled from the market and then a subsequent version of the song might have been released in place of that or whatever it goes into the detail on all of that. Uh, yeah, it, it, it re really is, you know. I, I must say that Al Alan's book is called There Was a Time, um, if you can find that book. And that's that's basically is his book about his years with James Brown, particularly. And Alan is involved now uh, as a producer for uh, a documentary series that is going to be um, for A&E, uh, cable television, that will... Mm -hmm probably be aired next year sometime i think it's going to be i think it's a four episode four mm. consecutive night episodes that that okay. uh, about about james that they're yeah. in in uh, production now and alan that alan is one of the awesome. producers on that yeah so that's something to look forward to very it's, much so because we've been talking about this we pardon, have been talking about, we have been talking about mr dynamite the documentary that Alan yeah. was involved with and did like an audio commentary with Quest Love and Christian McBride. Th and that, that was, I think that was as fabulous a documentary on ours as I've ever seen. I thought that was just absolutely done, done brilliantly. The, the editing particularly of, of using the musical examples that were, were spoken about, particularly by Christian, my brother and others. And, and just all of a sudden, you know, they just cut right into like a live performance mm -hmm. of the song to really just, it was absolutely, I think, just wonderfully, wonderfully done. Um, you know, it, it, it is the opportunity that I had to know James Brown, like I did and for the years that I did, is, is really just one of the most, um, it's something that's difficult for me to even still get my arms around. You know, the experiences that I had with him because of my brother and because of mm -hmm. Alan's mm -hmm. relationship with him. And if you knew somebody, you know, any, anybody that knew Prince, 
particularly anybody that worked with Prince, if they said Prince is the most amazing or the most interesting or the most fascinating person that I could ever imagine knowing, I couldn't argue with that. The only thing is, is I knew James Brown too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And partly because of my age <coughs> and, and what a relationship meant, you know, when I was growing up. If there's any one person that I could honestly say to me, because of the nature of our relationship and what his music and everything meant to me and the history of, of them as individuals and what they meant just to everything. It might be interesting to say, to, you know, that there was somebody even more fascinating and incredible in so many regards to me than Prince was, and that was James Brown. I cannot imagine a human being more amazing in so many respects than James Brown. And for a lot of different reasons, um, you know, some of which are just personal to me, but others, you know, that would resonate to people that, that you know, would have never had the opportunity to mm -hmm. know him. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do just with the particular, you know, the circumstances of James Brown, the person that he was, and the time and the circumstances in which he lived and grew up. Um, for example, it's not for me, not just as a human being, but for obviously as, as, as a white person to try to tell anybody who is black or of color or any you know person that is still considered in this country to be the other. It's not for me to define for you mm. what your life is or what, for example, the experience of what it means to be a black human being in this country or anywhere else. It's not for me to, you know, to try to describe that or to say that or make a contest out of the realities of your existence on a day to day basis versus somebody else. Mm -hmm. But I think you can because whatever indignities that somebody like Prince growing up in the 1960s as a young black kid in the city of Minneapolis, it's not for me to talk about, you know, what that means or what those experiences are in comparison to anybody else. Mm -hmm. But I think anybody can understand that perhaps Prince's worst day mm -hmm. might have been better than James Brown's best day. Mm -hmm. Growing up in Jim Crow South in the 1930s and 40s mm -hmm. with a seventh grade education. What opportunities does a person like that have with all of that reality without this amazing talent and the absolute will that James yeah. Brown had to survive? There was James Brown never had the luxury. I, I used to get so aggravated, even in the 60s, when writers of music, whether it was jazz or pop music or whatever, would talk about the music, for example, of the Beatles, which I happen to love a lot of that stuff and understand the absolute incredible artistry of particularly John Lennon, Paul McCartney. If you look mm -hmm. at, at mm -hmm. their work and the music that they were creating particularly stuff like, you know, Day in the Life, the Sgt. Pepper's, Abbey Road, um, Strawberry Fields Forever. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and everyone that was looking at what was pop music was now considered to be art. Fine. Mm -hmm. I get mm -hmm. it. I agree mm -hmm. with that. But those same people at the same mm -hmm. time would refuse to think of or write about James Brown in the same context. He was just this, oh, this fabulous entertainer. Right. If you want to hear the great, have the greatest entertainment light of your life, go see James Brown. But it was never from the context of understanding that this was art mm -hmm. on a mm -hmm. level that was was at the highest absolute. And you know who understood that? Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. You know, so so screw everybody else. Mm -hmm. They understand it. Musicians of that era understood. But I used to get so aggravated about that. But James Brown never had the luxury of even sitting back and even considering his own music art because he was out there working for a living. Mm -hmm. And that was his attitude. I go to work. This is what I do. This is my job. 
you know? And the fact that it was all of this is almost like coincidental mm. to what his basic attitude was. Because even in the 1960s, where he literally was the most famous and well-known face of a black American other than Muhammad Ali, you know? And what he meant so much to the community, the black American community at, at that time, he realized that even at the top of his, you know, he was the biggest thing out there, controlled his own business like nobody did. It was right. unprecedented the way he controlled that. Barry Gordy didn't even control Motown like James Brown controlled right. his own, you know. Um, but inside him, every night he's going out on stage to give everything he can because still there is that thought inside, this could all disappear so quickly. Mm. And what do I have left as somebody coming out with a seventh grade education? What else is there for me to do that I can succeed at and control like I do this? And it's basically like every night he's got to go out there because I have to do this. Because if I don't succeed at this, this could all go away. And what am I left with? You know? And 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 that was his whole, that was his attitude. He said, and, and he used to call me, you know, he used to call me Rick. I mean, that's when I was Rick. He said, Rick, it's time for me to go to work. Mm -hmm. I said, Mr. Brown, I understand. You know? Now he was a superstar, you know, and took advantage of everything that that brought. But when you scratch the surface, this was a guy that understood, you know, the whole context. Prince, with all the obstacles that could be put in front of any young kid aspiring to be what he was, and all of that, Prince never really looked at it from the standpoint of, this is my job. He once got very aggravated at me when I referred to what I did with him as my job. Mm. I work for you. This is what my this is what I do for a living. It's my job to come in and play your music and be a part of your bit. And Prince would you think this is just a job? And I said, Well, Prince, I don't mean that in a critical sense. I like my job. You know, I like what I'm doing. But this is what I do for a living. And at the end of the day, I go home. And tomorrow I come back to work. Prince's whole thing was like, he really looked at the whole thing as creating Oz. He was the Wizard of Oz. And he really liked the idea of, of creating this alternate reality. Mm -hmm. Everybody should want to be a part of to the same degree that he looked at it. And some did, and some, and, and many of us were very grateful. I'm glad that I can come to work and be a part of this. Being on the road and traveling Europe with that entourage was big fun. You know, who wouldn't love being a part of all that and knowing that every night you're part of an ensemble that is going out and producing and realizing music at absolutely the top level of, of quality and ability because of the artistry and everything that is inherent in this guy and his music. But at the end of the day, my whole thing was, it's still my gig. It's a gig. I dig it. But, you know, it's like Prince had that luxury to kind of be able to, in his time, you know, look at it from, and I just, I just look back and said, boy, that, that is a fundamental difference. And once again, it's, a, it's about time. You know, it's about the particular circumstances. Um, Prince was obviously every bit as, as sensitive as he would be to every aspect of what it meant still to be a black person in America. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is just, you know, individuals and how they look at the circumstances they are. James Brown, another another significant difference between the two, James Brown was inherently a people person. He loved mm -hmm. engaging and being mm -hmm. surrounded by people of all walks of life. Mm -hmm. This was a guy that could sit and have a conversation with people like Senator Strom Thurmond or Jesse Holmes. Mm -hmm. You know, guys that were the embodiment of everything that a James Brown was the antithesis to. Mm -hmm. James understood that. 
James understood that to these guys, you want to look at my at who I am and black people and people of color as the other. I get, you know, sacred, the whole, that whole old style thing. James Brown would sit and ask and say, you know, in a con might be in a room, find himself and said, Mr. Thurman, how's your family? Mm -hmm. And they might talk about that. And Mr. Thurman, excuse my trying to, you know, <laughs> Mr. Brown, how's your family? Okay. You know, because James Brown was not going to give it up. Because he said, I will relate to you as a human being, because in my manner of relating to you on that basis, you will not have the opportunity to relate to me at this point in time in any other manner than that. Now, once this is over and you go out in the room and you can talk about black people in any disparaging way, I can't control that. But right now you are with me and we are talking to each other as human beings. And James loved those kinds of encounters. And heaven help anybody that would try, mm -hmm. to, you know, because James Brown was not afraid of anybody or anything. And the manner in which he could relate to all different kinds, he loved the ability to go into a room and suck the air out of it in a manner that says, I am going to talk to you and we are going to talk and we are converse. What used to frustrate James at times was the fact that he realized that with his lack of a formal education, he sometimes did not have the vocabulary to articulate so much of what he knew. Mm -hmm. And that used to frustrate him at times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, he was very, very insecure and very, you know, very, uh, you know, no one accused James Brown of false modesty in any <laughs> situation. But you could scratch between the surface and occasionally he would say to my brother or someone and said, I wish I could, I wish I could, un, I wish I could articulate this in a manner that could really make the point. And he was always interested in having some people around him that could do that for him. You know, I said, let me ask this person to try to explain what I know and what I'm trying to say, which was a very interesting, you know, part of, of, of him. Um, he was so smart. And he was smart enough to know what he didn't know. And mm -hmm. realize, oh boy. Mm -hmm. And when, when I think of James Brown more than anything else, I think of, okay, imagine this is a guy that's growing up and this has the opportunity. And, and the poverty that he lived in. I mean, we're talking about, you know, him probably living in his first maybe 10 or 11 years of his life, probably in, in, in a house that, or, or, or in a, a, a domicile that didn't have indoor plumbing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He, he lived with his aunt. He lived in a whorehouse. His aunt was ran a whorehouse. Mm -hmm. You know, his father, you, you, you know. So you imagine with everything that a guy like this has, if this is a guy that had had an opportunity to have a full education and the options and abilities and opportunities to do anything else he might have wanted to have done with his life, this guy would have could, you know, could have been anything, anything he wanted. But for the realities of what's, and he said, he said, you know, he wanted to be, he wanted to be a boxer, he used to box. You know, he wanted to be a, a baseball player for a minute because those were opportunities that young black people could have mm -hmm. that at least could earn you a living, you know, beyond just what, picking cotton, cotton or being a, you know, being an itinerant farmer. You know, that, that's what the reality was. And when you look at what he accomplished through the will and the determination that he had, um, all of that goes in, into just, and then there was the music. You know? <laughs> right. And there, the, the, the experiences about when he was on the road, he would always carry a small portable stereo with him, you know, a little stereo record player. And he'd have it in his dressing room because he always had test pressings of his newest recordings. Because, you know, he was, you know, back then it was singles. It was all next 45, right. next single. And if I catch him at a good time when he'd had some new shit, you know, and I remember the one particular time, I think it was, it was in Pittsburgh and it was 1968, I think late 1968, somewhere around there. And I was in this dressing room. And at that point, it was it was him, his wardrobe mistress, whose name was Gertrude Saunders, who was always with him. And I just happened to be in with the two of them at this point. 
And he said, Rick, and I said, and I saw the stereo. I said, Mr. Brown, has he got something new? And he said, Rick, you know I do. So he put on some like just stood, you know, he loved blues. He loved just singing blues. That's really all he really loved more than anything else, just singing blues. Hmm. So he put on some blues stuff that he would record, just throwaway stuff that might come out on an album, just filler. And I'd listen to it and I said, Oh, that's good. You know, I think that bands happened and everything. And then he said, and then he'd laugh. He said, Ah, Rick, I got you. You know, I got you. So he put it on and he put on this thing. And all of a sudden, you yow, and give it up or turn it loose. You know, this wasn't going to be released for another two or three weeks. He had just recorded it like a few days before. And I'm sitting there and I said, Oh my God. I'm sitting in there with James Brown and he's playing me his next record. And you know, when you're when you're 14 or 15 years old, and you're in that situation, it's like, wow. And I I I still look back at that, you know, and and just try to try to try to remember what it was to be like that. I was at a show, one of the package shows in 1966, when when I was when my family was still living in Richmond, Virginia, and this was one of these package shows. On the same show with Stevie Wonder, Joe Tex, Solomon Burke, the Marvelettes, um, a bunch of other acts. My brother, who was a radio DJ at the time in Richmond, Virginia, already knew James Brown. He knew Joe Tex. He knew all of these guys. So I'm backstage at the show and I get to be, and Joe Tex was a really, really nice guy. And he, I had gotten to know him a little bit. And he said, Rick, anytime you want to, you know, if you're out front digging, if you want to come back, hang backstage, just come into my dressing room and hang hang with me in the dressing room. It's, it's cool. So I said, wow, I'm like 14 years old. So I'm sitting in Joe Tex's dressing room, and all of a sudden I look up and Stevie Wonder walks in and asks Joe Tex, he says, um, one of my suits ripped. Can I borrow a suit from you? Because I got to go on. I go on in like 10 minutes. So Joe Tex says, yeah, whatever you want, you know, grab a suit and whatever. Solomon Burke is sitting on the floor of the dressing room and they're kicking it. And I'm a little kid, 14 year old kid in the corner sitting in a chair and I'm listening to Joe Tex, Solomon Burke and Stevie Wonder just chilling, just talking about, you know, talking about what, what they're doing on the road. They mm -hmm. were talking about different musicians and their bands and it's just something I'm sitting there and I said, holy cow, that's the perspective that I had the opportunity to grow up in. So it's kind of like by the time I met Prince years <laughs> later, it was like, been there, done that. Yeah, it's like a Tuesday to you. <laughs> <laughs> and with James Brown, there's such a there's such a strong ownership component uh, to his music. But I mean, obviously, to uh, his his livelihood. I mean, King Records that was his record company. He he, well, he, well, he didn't print his didn't own, own records, right? Well, he did. Yeah, he didn't own the company. But I mean, basically, at that time, he he had a deal with King. That was certainly okay. much more lucrative than, you know, until he, you know, until he went for Polydor Records in 1971, I think. But yeah, I mean, he he basically um, had carte blanche to basically dis. He basically made his music and said to King Records, "This is my new one. This is what you put out." Yeah. What I mean, did he get like a higher percentage of the royalties with that relationship yeah. than he sure. would? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A absolutely. Um, he even. <laughs> You know, back back in those days when shall, shall we say the business aspect of that a lot was somewhat a little off the books now and then um james had some other side deals that were worked into his contract that were not the kind of deals that you would normally have with another label either mm -hmm. so yeah he, he he knew he knew how to work it he knew how to work all angles of it um he was and he was involved with every aspect of his business. Every night on the road, when the show was over, the road manager or whoever was responsible in his organization for that night's gig, sometimes it was my brother, would have to come into the dressing room afterwards and go over the one sheet. And basically, the, you know, this is what we did. Here's, here's what we spent for this gig. Here's the dollars and cents. And James Brown had a photographic memory. My brother might be responsible for a gig in Pittsburgh. And, you know, back in those days, it was very, very simple. 
ticket sales at most were four or five bucks. That was the highest ticket price. Mm -hmm. James Brown for years then had a deal that a child under 12 years old, when coming to the concert with a full, with a, with a, 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 an adult who was paying the full price, the kid could get in for 99 cents. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hmm. Advertisement and the promotion was very simple. You did radio advertisement, you did some posters, and that was pretty much it. So my brother might be responsible exactly, you know, for example, for this night's performance in Pittsburgh. So he will come and sit and, and say, Mr. Brown, this is what we took in at the box office. And but those days, it was almost cash and carry. I mean, mm -hmm. credit cards, you know, mm -hmm. even back mm -hmm. in the late 60s, very mm -hmm. few people had credit cards. You, you know, unfortunately, to make this it, not too many black people had credit cards. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even mm -hmm. then, not too many white people had, you know, so you understand yeah. what mm -hmm. it was cash and carry. So basically, they're bringing a, they're bringing a, a duffel bag of cash into James Brown's dressing room. And, and everybody's got guns. <laughs> uh, James, James used to have a gun. Mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. James always had a pistol in his mm -hmm. briefcase, in his coat. Never, ever saw it in his hand. Never. But there was always this thing, supposedly, that there was an overcoat that James always had that had a pistol in it. Whether it was loaded, I don't right. even know. You know. But anyway, um, so Alan would basically have to say, and hey, Mr. Ross and Mr. Leeds, you know, what, what are these expenses? And he said, well, this is what it costs for, for the radio uh, advertisements. And he said, Mr. Leeds, when we were here in Pittsburgh nine months ago, it was a lower rate. Why is that? Why are we paying more? And Alan would have to say, well, the rates went up. Nothing I can do about that. But James Brown was going to, he'd, he'd look at that and he said, how do you remember that? Mm -hmm. You've done 50 gigs between the last time you were in Pittsburgh and said, James Brown was on everything. Hmm. You know, didn't trust anybody. Yeah. But, you, you know, was on everything. And it was like, you know, I, I used to ask Alan, I said, well, what if a date didn't sell that? What if, what, you know, what if you're playing a 10,000 seat arena and you only got 3,000 people in it? You know, would there be hell to pay? And he said, sometimes there would. But he said, sometimes James would just chalk it up and said, hey, you know, it wasn't our time. Like, you know, we were only here maybe four or five months before. So maybe we realized it ain't going to be sold out this time. But he said, James was always much more careful when it was a big payday, because he basically felt that if anyone in my organization might want to try to skim something from themselves, they're going to do it on the big paydays, not on the little ones, which makes perfect common sense. Yeah. Because if you're going to steal, you steal where the money is. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't nickel and dime trying to skim something if they're only like $5,000 to play with. But if you got a night where you've grossed seventy five thousand dollars, and maybe somebody, one of the outside promoters, is saying, Isn't it, maybe I can, you know, skim a few bucks off the top of this one. That's when James's eye was like on every nickel and dime. Mm. Absolutely yeah. fascinating to, to, you know, yeah. So thank you so much for all this James Brown education. We're going to talk a little bit about um, some jazz rec a, a couple. Um, yeah, I'll give you. I think. I think you. I think. I think at this point you might you might get a little bit tired of hearing from me. So, so yeah. <laughs> little, you know, I you, will, you tell me now when when it's you know, when it's time. Yes, to talk. yes, yes. Uh, We're gonna talk about one that I want to talk about. It's one of my favorite um, favorites. I play it all the time. I have it here. Um, Search for the New Land, and the reason why by Lee Morgan, and the reason why Great I wanted to talk, talk to you about it. I'm I'm wondering, do you have it in your own collection? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Um, I, must, I, I uh, where's Lee Morgan? Got a lot of records back there, sir. Yeah, yes, everyone, yeah. Everyone, <laughs> he's up there. He's up there. Collection. That one's up there. Yeah. Um, so Wayne Shorter is on here, and I know that you love Wayne Shorter. So I absolutely. Wanted, um, yeah. So I wanted you to just talk about, like, um, if you listen to Search for the New Land a lot, what did you think about Wayne Shorter's performance on it, and? Just a little bit about, uh, um, you know, I, I love that album. It's been a while since I've listened to it. So you're giving me a really good reason later today and later tonight. Pull this <laughs> to it. Um, I, I just I, I just know it's a great album, you know, but um, Wayne, Wayne was. Um, well, here another another personal story for me in, in 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 Pittsburgh, my first little jazz band that I had in Pittsburgh um, in 1972 is December 1972. 
my band was the opening act for a concert of Weather Report and Ross on Roland Kirk and his band. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm like going to the gig that, that afternoon for Soundcheck and I'm thinking, these people are paying their money. They're going to hear three saxophone players. They can hear Wayne Shorter. They can hear Ross and Roland Kirk and they hear me. And I said, oh shit. I almost <laughs> turned around and went home. You know, I'm, I'm 20. I'm barely, tw you know, 20 years old. Um, we did our little set. And after our set, me and, me and the guys in, in, in the band were in our little dressing room. And Joe Zavano and Wayne Shorter come back and peek in our dressing room. And these like are two of my absolute biggest heroes in all of music. And they look in and they and they kind of said, you you, you were the fellas that were, were the first band to play before us? And I, and I said, yeah. He said, and Wayne Shorter and Joe Zavano looked at, not me, but all of us and said, y'all, y'all cats keep at it. You, you, you got it. You got a hell of a thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one that's one of those those moments for me that I'll never forget, you know, to, to have that kind of vote of confidence from, from your heroes like that. Um, Wayne, you, you know, obviously, beside just his his saxophone playing, uh, this is the most beautiful drop drop dead beautiful sound. I think anybody has ever produced on a soprano saxophone, particularly um, Branford Marcellus might be the other guy who I love as much on soprano. Um, his compositions, you know, the, the writing he did, not only for his own albums, the stuff he wrote for Art, you know, when he was with Art Blakey, all the stuff that he wrote with, with when he was with Miles. And of course, mm -hmm. some of the, the, the most amazing stuff in the world that he wrote when, you know, when he was with Weather Report. Um, you know, when, when I talk about probably the four or five or maybe, you know, he, he's definitely in my top 10, if not top five musicians. Mm, you know, mm -hmm. beyond just his, you know, just, mm -hmm. just because of what he contributed to the vocabulary and the concept of so much of his writing was so unique and, and, and brought such a different way of, of, of just thinking about music, you know. So when you really get into Wayne Short and really understand, you come out the other side and you say, well, I, it's a, it's a, you just end up thinking about music differently. Mm. And, and, you know, the rare individuals like that. Miles, of course, the Duke Ellington before that, Coltrane, uh, for me, and in, 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 uh, uh, like I said, Eddie Palmieri, mm -hmm. and in the context of the of of pop music, absolutely Prince. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, try 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 to think of the trajectory and the evolution of of pop music without Prince. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I you know Prince never sold as many. I mean, sold a lot of records. He never sold as many records as, as some of the other artists. Mm -hmm. of his era certainly not as many as michael jackson or probably even as madonna right but i don't think michael jackson has the influence on the actual music and the and the way music evolved and the way so many musicians would respond to prince's music there were musicians from all different kinds of genres mm -hmm. that in that particular period in the you know the mid 80s that would that would wait for Prince's next album in order to try to understand what they were maybe able to do next, mm. you know, and that's what really you mm -hmm. know, like a James Brown before that, Sly Stone to a certain extent, I uh, also certainly mm -hmm. George Clinton and that and Stevie Wonder, but in jazz, um, you know that that that's that's what Charlie Mingus said about Charlie Parker when he heard that Charlie Parker died when he died in nineteen when was fifty five, um, he said. All the jazz musicians now are not going to know what to do next, hmm. <laughs> you know, and those are the artists, you know, when you find a handful of artists that can have that, that influence and that significance to what everybody's listening to. And, and Wayne Shorter was, was in, in jazz on, on, on that level, just absolutely just beyond brilliant. So I just have a, f a few more. We're going to wrap it up. Just a few more rapid fire questions. Um, I know that you've talked about having dinner with Miles and Prince and Sheila, yeah. but when you talked about it, you didn't talk about the interaction that Miles had with John L. Nelson. Can you talk a little bit about that dinner and specifically Miles and John L.? What was their rapport like? There really, really wasn't too too much john john was not a talkative person he was a, he was a very quiet person mm -hmm. and i don't really remember that there was you know too much um interaction you know specifically between them i i as, as you can gather from from the time you've been spending with me i'm not shy about running my mouth <laughs> i was so 
so grateful to Prince for asking me to join them for that, for that dinner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I also have a feeling that Prince did have an ulterior motive. <laughs> that I think he was interested in knowing that I was going to take advantage of the situation. Like mm -hmm. I said, mm -hmm. it ain't every night that I'm going to be able to have dinner with Miles. So I, I was not apologetic about getting the conversation rolling. It was like, all right, Miles, what I need to know is this, you know, <laughs> like, and as soon as Miles got off on the tangent, Miles wouldn't shut up. It was great. You could just sit back and let him roll. And I think that's what Prince wanted me for then. And that's fine. That's perfect. I'm glad to be there, if anything, for that. Um, so if, you know, so if there was anyone interrupting or trying to get Prince, get Miles to talk, it was me. So mm -hmm. the problem was, is that if, if John was really trying to get anything, he was probably thinking, if only this guy leads would show the hell up, maybe I could get, you know. <laughs> so I must say that maybe, However. you know. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Now, I absolutely love, I call it the LP music uh, record that you did with, I call him St. Paul, um, yep. Paul Peterson. And I want to know, when is the next album coming out? I would love to have another LP music album. We, we want to do one. And um, it's one of those things, Paul is, is very busy. You know, mm -hmm. Paul has a lot on his plate. Good for him. You know, I mean, he's, he's involved in a lot of different things. We want to do another one. And it's one of those things that we will probably do in stages. It's a matter of like, can I grab Paul for, you know, an afternoon, a couple of days and run in the studio and do something? And we'll try to have something, you know, out. So we, we, we do plan to do one. The basic thing is, is that, you know, we're doing this all on our own nickel, pretty much, um, which is always another factor, unfortunately. So, um, you know, we, we, we did the LP No Words uh, through a crowdfund. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. may try to, we may try to actually do another crowdfund if we, you know, we can. Yeah, uh, I participated would, in that. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I know that I would love to contribute. I'm sure others would because it's really a phenomenal record. And talking I'm, 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 I'm so happy with that. You know, when I was speaking about when things left unsaid, you know, the opportunity to work with. Here, here's a fascinating thing. You know, I know Paul since 1984, and when we were, you know, briefly together in the family. Everyone knows the story about that. After the family, you know, when he, he left and went on his own, I didn't see Paul probably for, you know, 10 years after that. You know, I was working with Prince. He's doing his own thing. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we start to get together and we, you know, we did some things together in the late 90s. And then when we, when we decided to put the family back together and record, you know, call it F Deluxe and the albums that we did, particularly Gaslight, the live album that we did and everything, we were doing some F Deluxe gigs again. But there was a point in time that I started to realize and really have the op you know, opportunity to be working with Paul on, on, on that stuff and realize that, boy, this guy is so much more of a musician than I would have just, you know, thought about just from being have from him being like a 20 year old guy who's singing the stuff in the family and knowing the background that he had, because the whole Peterson family, everybody in the family are musicians, mm -hmm. wonderful musicians. So we're, we're, we're kicking up. Actually, we went to see a, a gig one night. Paul and I were hanging and, and, and it was a, it was, it was a Christian McBride gig. And, and it was, it was a concert, Christian McBride and a band of his, but it wasn't a straight up jazz band. He was doing kind of a quasi, um, light hip hop kind of thing. He had Patrice Russian with him on the gig and he had a DJ. So it was kind of an extended groove gig, which Christian is brilliant at. I mean, besides his jazz shit. Um, and Maceo and his band was on, Maceo Parker and his band was on the gig. So anyway, we're, we're digging, we're, di we're listening to Christian and Paul says to me, he said, no, we should, try, we should, we should, we should do something like that. And I said, yeah, why not? So we started to get together and, and put this thing together. And we had um, Stokely Williams was, was, um, you know, playing drums with us on, on a bunch of the stuff um, that we were doing. We were doing some gigs and it was basically just finding some grooves and just jamming on them. But then we started to get a little more ambitions to start actually writing some music. Hmm. So when we started, I said, well, let's, let's try to do a record and let's, you know, so we did the organize the crowd fund. So now I'm, I'm working with Paul. God, I got to tell you, Paul Peterson is maybe one of the most brilliant and wonderful musicians I have ever worked with. Hmm. 
he has an understanding of the music that we play with very little on with very little knowledge about the source so hmm. i'm talking about all of these references from all of these musicians in this music that i grew up listening to and everything and he doesn't have a clue to hardly any of you know i could mention like you know he, he'll pick up a guitar and he'll start to do some great shit paul can play some really nice guitar and i said man that reminds me of some stuff like john abercrombie would be. you know john Abercrombie was a very famous guitar player passed away several years ago, but in the 70s and 80s, anybody in jazz knew who ja John Abercrombie was a guitar player. Paul had never heard of him. Hmm. You know, I said, John who? You know, so Paul is coming up with all of this great music. And once again, it's the thing, I might have an idea for a piece of music, and a song that's half written. I'll bring it into Paul and he'll instinctively do something amazing with it. And it's something that I'll sit back and say, wow, that's exactly what I would have done, except I didn't. You know, and it's like I can start a sentence and all of a sudden Paul is finishing the thought and vice versa. And once again, it's that wonderful opportunity where I have an idea, but I know what I would do if I were to finish it. So what's the fun in that? Because I know ahead of time what I'm going to do with it. And like, you know, it, it's it's wonderful for people to say how much they enjoy what I play and what I do. But you got to understand something. I hear what I do every day. So it ain't, you know, it's like, oh, well, well, cool. But like, uh, it's just what I do. <laughs> and if anyone's going to get bored with it, it's going to be me because I have to hear everything I think of or play. And after a while, it's just like, well, okay, I'm good and I can do that. But I want, you know, it's like you need a conversation. You need to have a dialogue with somebody. You want to throw a thought out there and have somebody come back at you with a reaction that you wouldn't have and wouldn't think of. Like, this is a cool point, but this is what I think about that. And then you have to react to that and then move on. And when you can find a relationship with a musician like that, it's worth its weight in gold. And mm -hmm. I found that in Paul. It's ridiculous. And he has such an amazing background in, in, in just music. Bring all it. And I'm saying, where does this come from? Because you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> you know, you don't all, but you're making all this music that fits so perfectly with, you know, the stuff that I'm trying to book, but it puts me in a situation when I have to react. So that means that I have to grow. I have to be able to do something that's a little outside of what I would think of myself. And that's the most enjoyable thing about music. Like I said, so much of that was inherent in, in the opportunity that I had to work with all these musicians and, and recording things left unsaid. But I had this experience working with Paul. And mm -hmm. Paul is a tremendous producer. He's also a master at Pro Tools, you know, the recording mm -hmm. software. Mm -hmm. So we can realize the ideas so fast. That as soon as we got an idea, Paul can complete it with it, bam, 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 it just moves so fast. And I'm sitting back and I said, I don't know where Paul gets this vocabulary from. I mean, he says he gets it from his mother, who was mm -hmm. a tremendous pianist and, and, and you know, um, singer and, and, and his whole family. Paul is the youngest of, of the five of them. Ricky is is tremendous keyboard player. His older brother, Billy, is two sisters, uh, Linda and Patty. But hands down, from somebody that just has a creative spark, Paul is this absolutely amazing musician. And in doing this album with him, provided me with so much opportunity to do so many things that I wouldn't have been able to do on my own. You know, and, and that that's what that project and what, what I hear and that, you know, I'm here. Well, that's me. But boy, that's not what I would have done if left to my own devices. That's because I'm, I, I've got Paul like, you know, bringing all these other things. And, and, and a lot of it's not spoken because it's like now you've got somebody else you're answering to. Mm -hmm. I can't just come up and just skate with my own shit because like I got Paul here and said, you know, he turned around and said, Eric, I love you. But you, could you try to play something that a horn that you haven't played ten thousand times before? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and vice versa. Also, you know, Paul I said, "No, don't get you, you know, you know, yeah." I heard Stevie Wonder before. I don't need that. Oh, there. You know, <laughs> you know. But those are the kind of things, and and that that's what Paul's Paul's terrific. I mean, in, in that regard. And I said, I've known this guy for like twenty years. I didn't realize until like only like five ten years ago. Oh my god. I've got this gold mine of, of, of an artist here. Mm 
So anyway, yeah. So we we will we will do more. Absolutely. All right. So my second question is: I had the um, the opportunity to see both of these live performances in Minneapolis. One was at Dakota in 2017. Actually, St. Paul wasn't there because I think he was in Australia at the oh, time. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And then you also did a performance at the Ice House in 2019. And I'm going to mm -hmm. be honest, like, and the, and these were in April because celebrations, the Prince yeah. celebrations were happening in April then. Yeah. Now they've moved to June, <clears throat> and it just doesn't seem complete to go to celebration without seeing <laughs> you or LP music. So I'm curious, like, what you guys consider doing a residency at the Dakota? Because I would come every night, uh, like, during celebration. Like, have you guys even talked about that? Because I'm sure a lot of the fans would love to see you guys play live. We, we did talk about doing, uh, trying to put a, a, a kick this year for the celebration. Um, it just didn't happen. And I, I can't really tell you why, mm. you know, um, it was one of those things that, yeah, we need to address this. And then before I realized it was like, it was like the middle of May where, where, where we would have had, would have had everything organized already. And we just said, eh, maybe it's a little too late mm -hmm. rather than try to cram something in. Um, to be honest with you, sometimes it's difficult for us to get the musicians we want. Got it. Um, Stokely, you know, is is like one of our first calls, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, Stokely is very busy, <laughs> you know, doing doing what he does, and it's sometimes a matter of of trying to get everybody in one place at, at one time. And at my age, I'm not that interested in doing something unless I'm, I'm I know it's like with the guys that I really want to, you know, do it with. Got um, it. As far as live gigs, once again, economics. The unfortunate reality of of um, doing bar bands is such that even for us, there aren't too many venues that will give us a guarantee. So basically, we're working for the door. And on any given night, that could be a nice night. But there are nights basically where I have to tell the music, you know, if I got guys that I said, OK, you're willing to do this. I said, are you willing at the end of the night that maybe you'll walk out of the gig with only 50 bucks in your pocket? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and sometimes it's even for me, I love this music, but I mean, I'm, I'm 71 years old and it's like, you know, all of the shit that I got to go through, it's a young man's game, because I got to schlep gear and everything. You know, we don't have the budget for roadies. We're, we're, we're schlepping everything. I'm schlepping shit just like I did when I was 20 years old. So I'm not 20 years old any longer. You know, I love playing that damn baritone. I don't like carrying that damn baritone. That thing is heavy, you know, so, so it's like. Um, I have to really sit and I think I said, am I really wanting to put all of the effort that I have to do in order to make this work? And I mm -hmm. have no idea at the end of the night what kind of money I'm going to be putting in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so if we could, you know, if we could talk to Dakota in wanting us to do a residency and being able to even like give them some guarantee, it's something that we would very, you know, very much look into. Um, one of the unfortunate aspects is when I look at the, 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 um, Everybody knows in the general economy of the United States of America, one of the most devastating aspects of it is the growth in inequality. Yes. You know, the, the gap between people at the lower end of an economic range and those in the middle and those in the upper class, greater than it's ever been. And it's what's going to destroy this country if it continues like this. And the music industry is no different. Mm -hmm. When I look at the kind of money that I used to make back in the late 70s and early 80s when I was a bar band musician, where I literally was in bands that were that were working like 275 gigs a year, hmm. and knowing hmm. the kind of money that I was making back then, in real dollars, I could put a band together in Minneapolis, and if even I could find the venues that I could work five or six nights a week, I would probably make less money in real dollars today than I was making as a bar band musician back in 1980. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. That's the why is that, Eric? What, what, what's going because on? Because no. Nobody, nobody wants, nobody, you know, unless you are a marquee that can really demand a sold out, you know, house, which I'm, I'm not. I mean, for all the, you know, people who know me from the Prince crowd, you know, I may be a star for all of that. But when it comes right, to right, the right. actual marketplace for the music that I play, mm. uh-uh. And, um, you know, it, 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 ju it just never happened the way that I would have liked to you know, to buy benefit. Now, I will say that there are some decisions that I've made in my career that maybe were not in my own best interest. I have no regrets of them, 
But mm. I, you know, I, I, I enjoy my life and always have enjoyed my life. So I, I have no regrets. But I was never at times the most ambitious about wanting to get out there and, and really wanting to make some of the sacrifices that I might have been, had to have made in order to, you know, build something over a period of time. So um, reality, you know, the reality is, is that, and it's, it's another thing too, I understand nobody in, in, in the bar band circuit on the club level is making a lot of money, not even the club owners. I mean, you know, it's always the thing I said, I understand what that business is about. So I understand when you're looking at the overhead of having a club, you've got wait, you know, you've got the wait staff, you've got a restaurant going on, or whatever. And if you got a, if you got musicians that, you know, you can get maybe fifteen, maybe twenty dollars at the door, and maybe you get fifty people in there. You know, that ain't a whole lot of money. Ain't nobody making money that night. You know, the the the, the club might be making it at least on the food that they're selling, mm. but even that, they're barely breaking even too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like I don't understand the economic realities. Right. The other thing is this, is that um, the fact that it is so easy to just find music without having to leave your home. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I love YouTube. I can find anything. I mean, like as an Eddie Palmieri fan, not mm -hmm. being able to be in New York where the bulk of his gigs are, but almost every gig that Eddie Palmieri is that's on YouTube a day or two later. You know, and I can go to YouTube and I said, and Eddie Palmieri ain't making no money from me watching him on YouTube. Mm. Anyone, mm. you know, so, mm. the, you know, the, the, there's a lot about about the business model of music that has changed. And, you, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I don't have any gripe with Taylor Swift selling, you know, playing in front of 100,000 people. Good for her. But, you know, what the hell does that do for me? You know, right. it's, it's just it's a whole different thing. So, um, you know, a lot of people said, well, when are you coming to our town? I'll come to your town if you want to if you want to send me an airline ticket and, and, and provide me a hotel room. I'll be mm -hmm. there tomorrow. You know, I'll say um, less. OK, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that that's that's the, the, the unfortunate reality is that the the lower, you, you know, the, the more less lucrative aspect of the business is, is less lucrative than I think it ever has been. Mm. You know, I, I don't I don't know how young I don't know how younger musicians, you know, are able to support themselves in the in the manner that even I was able to. And you know, it wasn't like I was rich. I mean, you, you know, I was working 275 gigs a year and at the end of every month I might have a hundred bucks in my checking account. You know, but at least I had a roof over my head and I you know I, I could I could afford I could afford the, you know, some more Art Blakey albums, <laughs> you know, and but now they, I, I don't know how they, I don't know how young kids do it. I really don't. Yeah. Do you get like, you know, I'm not trying to get all in your stuff, but I mean, just as you've been in this business for so long, mm -hmm. are you, do, and you know, we we hear about the actors striking all these type of things. Do you get some sort of royalties from any of these works that we talk about so much? Oh yeah, now? yeah. Yeah, I mean the the, the 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 um yeah the stuff that I I, I wrote you know with, with Prince you know like okay. uh, and, and there, there weren't that there really weren't that many you know that that I had a piece of um, I was a co-writer on it's going to be a beautiful night okay you know mm -hmm. and since that was on Sign of the Times that was a big album a huge selling album I still get a nice little you know thing from that. Um, I got paid, you know, well for all the Madhouse stuff because okay. um, I didn't write, I didn't have any writers on the first album, but I had writers on, on a bunch of the songs on the second album. And, and of course, on, 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 you know, but um, when you have an album that only sells like 15,000 copies, there's, mm. you know, you get a royalty check and it might be for $9.90. You know, right, so. right. mm -hmm. But um, I have no complaints. You know, because I under, I understand I understand how the business works. Mm -hmm. um, I I did well with Prince. You know, I, I I have I have little, you know, and and there were there were there were some times where Prince was very generous. You know, not always, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know the 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 times when Prince was generous, at least in certain circumstances with me, far outnumber and outweigh the times mm -hmm. when I could look at Prince sideways and say, eh, "What's up with that?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I said. At the end of the day, the guy gave me a record contract. Mm. 
mm-hmm. with a with a huge recording budget that was mm-hmm. completely inappropriate for the for the actual market for the music that I make, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and told me, here, go, do whatever the hell you want with this. What what how you know I can't complain about you know how many people would have given their first child to have an opportunity like that. So um, yeah, I, I I got no complaints. Yeah, you know, there are a couple of things that might have fallen through the cracks over the years. But hey, you know that's life. So this is our last slide for you, Eric. And I just again this week was Bonnie's birthday. Yeah. And any yeah. story I can um, like anytime um, I would love to hear more stories about Bonnie. So I found this picture and it's Bonnie and I see Dwayne, Prince's brother. I see you and I see Atlanta yeah, Bliss Atlanta to the Bliss. right. Yes. The guy, on the, the guy on the far end is Leroy Bennett. He was the production designer. He is probably next to Prince, the most important person of all of those tours. Uh, <laughs> most definitely. Yeah. And um, do you know who the female is next to? Yeah, that's uh, her name is Bevela. Um, she was Levi Caesar's wife oh. for a while. They were married for a while. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So, she she was um, um, hair and makeup wardrobe on, on the tours with us. Awesome. Yeah. So um, can you take us out with like a Bonnie story or like or when you think of Bonnie, like like does something come to mind or just just a general feeling that she was a sweetheart, a really warm person, and funny. I mean. Any situation that you were in, any room that you were in, as soon as Bonnie walked into the room, the, the vibe was going to be better. You know, she had just a wonderful sense of humor, very self-deprecating sense of humor. You know, she could laugh at herself. Um, mm-hmm. We had a wonderful time. You know, it, it, she, she was one of those persons that had an infectious laugh, too, because she was somebody, if she started laughing at something, even if you didn't know what she was laughing at, <laughs> you'd start laughing with her. You know, she she was yeah, just just a just a, a joy to have you know around, and because of her personality. Here, I, 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 I tell you, is there she? She had a sailor's mouth. You know what that means? <laughs> yes. You know? yeah. Yes. Which which was very endearing to all of us, right? And she did not, she wasn't afraid of anybody, including Prince. <laughs> and on dying respect, I mean, it was the boss and everything, and dying love and respect and loved the gig that she had. But she could, and, and because of her personality, she could say things to Prince that nobody else could get away with. <laughs> because Prince, you know, before she would say something, Prince would be in hysterics. <laughs> and then she could just take it from there. <laughs> you know, so all I remember, what I do remember is on the on the Love Sexy tour, for whatever reason, and I don't really know why, when Prince would do Purple Rain on, on that song, I played organ. I played the B3 on Purple Rain. Hmm. I never asked him why. He just said, Eric, I want you to play... <laughs> You know, there, were, there was no horns on that song, obviously. Mm-hmm. It was just him mm-hmm. singing the verse going into the guitar solo. Mm-hmm. So he said, Eric, Eric, uh, why, why don't you play B3 on that? And I said, well, well it, Bonnie plays B3. He said, no, you play it instead. So, and the B3 was set up on the stage in her rig. You know, she had the B3 a synth on, in, her synth in, in her corner. So I would put my horn on the stand, run over and jump up on, on, on and play B3. Now she would be singing background, she, you know, background of Purple Rain once it got to the choruses and everything. But Bonnie, for the rest of the, while the song, you know, the first verse and during the guitar solo, Bonnie's just standing there next to me doing nothing, which was just weird because I'm playing her instrument and she's just standing there doing nothing next to me. Well, she was doing something. Every night she was in my ear (laughs) making jokes about Prince. Hilarious. (laughs) And some of the most foul mouth. You know, I mean, hilarious stuff that you can imagine every night. And I'm trying, they're trying to play the damn song, keep a straight face. They find, shut up. Well, you just, oh, no, oh, no. Oh, no, you didn't say that. You know, every night it was like that. So, I mean, I just used to look forward. I said, let me get to the organ here. What Bonnie's going to say tonight. You know, yeah. yeah Thank that you. Was, that, jokes, that, was, that was my girl. Yeah. yeah awesome. Everybody loved Bonnie. Yeah. 
Well, thank all right. you so all much right, for taking time out of your day to be with us. I so wanted to hear about things thank left you. unsaid. Thank you so oh, much well, for talking I, about that album. I, I, th I thank you. I thank you for asking me about that album because that album obviously meant an awful lot to me. Yeah. And it means a lot to us. So enjoy the rest of your day. We're going to take you off right. the stream. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Thank you. So okay. Much. Bye. <laughs>